Thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, I'm Susan Prager and it's my privilege to have uh, served as Dean at Southwestern starting late in 2013. My respect and love for Southwestern has grown and grown and grown over these years. And part of what I wanna try to do today is to capture for you why I love the place so much. Um, first, I want to speak about its tremendous impact on Los Angeles and Southern California in particular, uh, but also more broadly because our students fan out to all kinds of places, including New York and Washington, D.C. What I see in Southwestern is a place where people who are determined and who have a strong character and what today we would call grit have come over the years. Very often people who haven't been thought of necessarily as people who should go to law school. Our founder was in his twenties. And in that period, right after, right before and after World War I, when anti-immigrant feelings were running so strong, he wanted to create a law school for anyone who had the drive and the intellectual capacity to go to law school to be able to do that. That sounds much more normal today, but it was not then. To him, that meant Southwestern would have a night school for the people who worked during the day and a day school for the people who worked at night. It was a school for people who worked and he wanted each of them to have opportunity. The symbolism of that is personified in the fact that the first graduate was female. Betty Trierberry came to Southwestern at a time when she couldn't vote in federal elections. And yet she became a lawyer and became the first female public defender in the nation. In fairness, I have to share with you that that was because LA had the first public defender's office in the country. Tom Bradley came here, having graduated from undergrad at UCLA and worked in the Los Angeles Police Department where at the time he began in LAPD, he could only be assigned to work with another black officer. He came to the night program graduating in 56. Obviously his, his grit and determination was evident and he became the first mayor of a very large US city other than Washington DC who was black and to this day is the longest serving LA mayor in our city's history. Soon, soon after he um, arrived at Southwestern, a young woman named Arlie Woods graduated. She became the first black female to ever serve on an appellate court in the entire nation. graduating very close in time to her was Vano Spencer, whom Jerry Brown's father appointed to the bench in the early 60s, and she became the first female Black judge in California. The Honorable Frances Munoz became the first Latina to serve as a judge in the, higher, in the entire nation, and she graduated in 1971. And of course, long before that, Stanley Mosk, for whom our courthouse in LA is named, served, he served as attorney general. He still holds the record of the longest serving California Supreme Court justice in California's history. I could go on and on and on, but the point is that Southwestern continues to supply people to a broad range of service as lawyers. Many people in the criminal justice system as public defenders, as DAs, as private lawyers representing clients, uh, to people in all realms of civil trial work, 
from family law to personal injury to major cases uh, in the corporate realm. And we have um, many people interested in excelling in negotiation. You're gonna meet a current student later today who is one of two who won the ABA's national tri uh, negotiation competition last year. And they were planning to go on to the international competition, uh, which was to be held in Montana. Uh, but uh, that, of course, uh, could not take place due to these special challenges we're facing now. So Southwestern grads are also, as students and beyond, characterized as people who look out for one another, who help one another. And that's another thing that I especially appreciate about the school. Um, it's very important that you all have a perspective that you're in this together, you're helping one another, and you're mainly trying to think about how you're all going to navigate the world well as law students and beyond. Southwestern provides wonderful encouragement for you getting at experience as a lawyer while you're in law school. And today that's more important than ever before because everyone wants to hire someone who already has experience. Our externs, for example, have the reputation of being the go-to people for people from other law schools in their extern settings. I tell a story about a placement that we had relied on uh, where they had had a bad experience with externs from another local law school. And they were, they had decided they were going to end their extern program, but they had already made a commitment to two guys from Southwestern for the next term. You can imagine what happened. They went, they were spectacular, and the placement decided rather than ending their program, they would have a program where they only hire people from Southwestern. Um, this is uh, in part a tribute to two of the faculty members who are in this group today, Chris Cameron from long ago and Anahid Garkanian, who've been running, she's been running this program in recent years. And this summer we had over 200 placements, including some that were not possible for us before. It was one of those few silver linings in the COVID crisis that we were able to have some people involved remotely with Washington DC placements that were very important. So that is, um, that is another um, of our strengths, our reputation that Southwestern students can really hit the ground running. And to me, that is, astonishing and um, really significant because it's due to the work that current students are willing to do and the emphasis that the school places on the importance of you learning to become a lawyer while you're in law school. Well, I could go on and on and on about this place, but I think my role now is to introduce you to a fabulous example of what the Southwestern faculty uh, is like. Um, Rachel Van Landingham came to Southwestern just a few months after I did. And so we have had a shared experience of growing appreciation of the place, ever growing, I have to say, in my case. Rachel spent 20 years in the Air Force, serving as a prosecutor and as defense counsel and developing her skills in the international realm with a focus on the military. She taught at the Air Force Academy at one point during that service. She's a superb classroom teacher who was quickly recognized as an expert in both the academic world and the public discourse. She's the author of more op-ed pieces than we can keep track of. She's courageous in her willingness to say things that people don't wanna hear. 
She's often sought out for her commentary. You know, my uh, symbol of how sought out she is, is that when CNN needs Rachel, they send a car for her. They don't do that for everyone. Um, so um, as I turn this program over to Rachel, I see her as symbolic of the fact that so many faculty at Southwestern are productive, excellent scholars, as she is, wonderful teachers in and out of the classroom, teachers who want to serve as mentors for their students, and of course, a person who serves the school. Uh, and Rachel has done that um, in ways that astonish me, given the amount of time involved it makes me think that she must sleep about two hours a night because she also has twin boys uh, and her family is very important to her. So with that, um, the amazing Professor Rachel Van Landingham. Thank you, uh, Dean Prager. That was overly generous. Thank you. Good morning to everyone that's here. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to Dean Susan Prager, who is a trailblazer in legal academia. She's a trailblazer as a woman, uh, as a powerhouse for, uh, female leader within Los Angeles. She was the first and longest, uh, first female dean at UCLA Law School um, and the longest serving there. Uh, she, she was the first uh, president of the American Association, first female president of the American Association of Law Schools, a, a national organization that helps lead law schools um, into the next century. She's just done fabulous things uh, for us and for our legal community. So I wanted to, to say thank you. Um, and we're very fortunate to uh, still be under her, her wisdom and her, and her leadership. Um, and I'm just trying to, trying to follow in her footsteps as we, as we all are. So good morning, everybody, a Saturday morning. Hey, it, it's raining for once in LA, so we have a reason to stay inside, but you have a lot of other things to do this morning. And I appreciate that. And I am so gratified to see you all this morning because I sure hope to see you uh, in my class in the, in the fall, um, next fall. I'm currently teaching on approximately 150 brand new law students right now in two separate sections of criminal law, um, which is my bread and butter first year course. And I, and I love it, um, I live for it. I was actually in the Air Force for 24 years. I counted every minute of them. Um, and I left because, not because I didn't love what I was doing. I had been everything from the chief of international law for David Petraeus that, that, that David Petraeus um, and, and spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan and Qatar and Kuwait, et cetera, uh, for four years at US Central Command. Uh, but I was also a prosecutor, a defense counsel, an appellate defense counsel, a, a nuclear surety inspector, chief of recruiting for the Air Force JAG Corps. Um, so I know a little bit about a lot, a lot of things. Uh, but I left that not because I didn't love it, but it's because I, I fell in love with teaching. Um, as uh, Susan mentioned, I did have the opportunity to teach at my alma mater, the US Air Force Academy. I walked into my first class. My job was as the deputy of the, of the legal department to ensure that uh, I wrote all the evaluations, et cetera, for our personnel, for all of our professors there and helped keep the train running on time. Um, but they did let me teach. My first time in the classroom uh, to teach uh, cadets at the Air Force Academy at the undergraduate level. I walked out of that classroom. I called my husband. He was, all, he was also, uh, he's, a, he's an army. Couldn't get into the Air Force, just kidding. Um, he was active duty Army, spent almost 30 years in the Army, very proud of him. Uh, but I called him up and said, hey, uh, guess what? I, wanna, I know what I want to do for the rest of my life, and that's to teach. And from that moment forward, my eye, eyes were on the prize in Southwestern. Uh, I have the honor of, of teaching here, and I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere, anywhere else. So I uh, believe I have the ability to share screens now. So we're going to get a, a little feeling of um, what it's like to have a law school class. So I'm Hoping you go on this journey with me, and I'm going to ask here in a moment. Come on, slideshow. Uh, can everyone see slides now? Put the thumbs up. Awesome. So yes. this is this is uh, as as I'm sure many of you um, are are experiencing right now. This is the world we're dealing with, but I can guarantee you can get a fabulous legal education whether we're in a pandemic or we're not. Right? We don't ignore the fact that we're in a pandemic. I hang out with my students. Because one day I realized I'd been online on Zoom with them for over two hours after class ended. And I'm like, I can't do this because I never will sleep. Um, but your professors, the professors here at Southwestern, my amazing colleagues, and I see many of them here today, 
um, have gone out of their way to ensure that what, if what we're missing in person, we compensate for ha by having tremendous amount of access, which has always been one of the strengths here at Southwestern, which is access to professors. Professors that will pick up the phone and call you. I was on the phone with a student yet last night. I was on a FaceTime with a student earlier in the day because they needed some one-on-one -on -one attention and, and we're here to give that too. But I also have a fabulous team of TAs. I have seven TAs, teaching assistants that, that took my class either last year or the year before. Uh, it's a team effort. It takes a village and we have a village and we have such an involved student body. So um, I pick from the best of my law students that from that from my criminal law class and they become my TAs and I'm honored to have them on my, on my team. So let's go. Uh, so criminal law, that's what I get to teach. I have the honor of teaching it and I love it. Uh, it's a, in the state of flux. Go LA, go LA County, go California with criminal justice reform. We're on it. Um, and so things in criminal justice are going to change with the bread and butter of what criminal law is. That's what you learn in 1L criminal law uh, in your 1L criminal law class. So we're going to get a sense of what we're going to do in a law school class, which is I often involve, I mean, every single class I involve my students. Um, why do we criminalize behavior? Why is murder a crime? Why is robbery a crime? Why is grand theft auto yeah, a crime? Who wants to take that one? So if you go ahead and raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on somebody and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself, please. Why criminalize behavior? This is something that's coming across the world, right? We criminalize certain behavior. The state says this is wrong. Why do we say through the state, right, which is a collective of us, we as society, we're going to say we're going to condemn, condemn this behavior. Kyla, go ahead, please. Um, I think that we or people in general criminalize behavior to hold people accountable and like set certain standards for society. Excellent. To set certain standards for society. Terrific. Uh, Amir, please go ahead. Uh, I think that we criminalize for two reasons. I think the first is that so one's ability acting doesn't impede on another's freedom. So you can't go kill a person because you would be, it's a bad example, but ruining their right to live. And another reason we criminalize, I think, is to teach people and allow them to learn what they should and shouldn't do. Okay, terrific. So I've gotten two strains that sound very, very familiar. I get the strain at that the theme that is that we want to have standards, right? So criminal law is often defined as society's collective moral condemnation of behavior. So it does deal with morality, which is our sense of right and wrong. But then we criminalize behavior for setting standards as Kyla accurately stated, so that we can tell people what not to do. Murder is a crime because we want to deter people from committing murder. Robbery is a crime because we don't want people to commit robbery. Right? A, we want to live and we want everybody else to have the, the, the choice to live as well. And we want our stuff and we don't want it taken from us by force. So we criminalize behavior because we don't want it to happen. We're setting that standard out there, right? So what if we could criminalize behavior and stop it before it actually happens? The harm that we're trying to prevent and deter through deterrence doesn't even occur yet. Welcome to the world of attempt crime. I'm actually teaching this right now for the end of the semester in my 1L classes. So when uh, Professor Garhanian asked me to teach today, I'm like, all right, we're on it. Let's talk about attempt law. Okay, so today we're going to be speaking about what's a, how do we criminalize and why attempts at a crime, a, an attempt at a crime, which is someone wants to commit murder, for example, but they fail. Where and when and how do we actually criminalize that attempt? That's what I'm really looking for. So often in a typical law school class, if anything can be typical because professors bring a wide variety of teaching methods uh, to their classrooms, but it's often typical to have a fact pattern that we talk about and then we explore and we, and, and, uh, we apply rules to. Where do we get these fact patterns in law school? Well, you don't usually just get them on a slide like this. I usually have you read cases, multiple cases. The reason, one of the reasons we read cases, right? We read these appellate decisions, decisions by um, judges that are looking at an earlier uh, earlier litigation. Uh, we're looking at these decisions because they provide a fact pattern of something that actually happened. And we're trying to tease out, was it lawful? Was this a lawful conviction? Or was there some something wrong there? So here's our fact pattern today. So John, so bear with me today, because you would have normally have, have read quite a, quite a few pages. Um, uh, roughly about an hour to hour and a half of outside prep time for, for every hour in class. So I'm assuming you've all read for class today, and here's our fact pattern. John committed a robbery of a convenience store. The witness, W, saw John commit the robbery. 
Now John's brother, Dan, because Dan loves his brother so much, Dan intends to kill, has the mental state, the desire, intends to kill the witness, W, so that the witness will not testify against John. Under a criminal law, when will Dan's acts be attempted murder? How close does he have to get to killing this witness before police can step in and say, nope, nope, there's probable cause, you're committing attempted murder, we're going to arrest you, possibly confine you before trial, and then have a trial in which you, in which you would be convicted for attempted murder. How close does he have to get? So it's just thinking, it's just thinking about killing somebody, thinking I'm, I really want to kill somebody, is that enough? enough for an attempted murder. Anybody? I have to take someone. Uh, Jocelyn, please. Jocelyn, excuse me. Jocelyn. Hi. Um, no, I would say no, it's not because he would also have to, um, I guess, attempt or take a step to uh, commit the intention. Perfect. Because in our, in our system of criminal law across the United States, we don't believe in, in thought crimes. We believe in an evil mind with an evil hand. So the fundamental axiom of criminal law, and you're already going to have it today, is that you have to have that evil man, evil mind with the evil hand. If you only have one of them, it's not a crime. So that's one rule. So in law school class, we're often applying rules to fact patterns. That's one rule, that you have to have an evil mind and an evil hand occurring at the same time for there to be a crime. What's the other rule? The more specific rule today that we're going to be working with is the rule of attempt crimes. What is the definition of an attempt crime in general? Um, it's when an individual with the intent to commit that target crime, here intent to kill, we're talking about um, whether or not uh, whether or not Dan's actually going to kill the witness, where the, where the individual with the intent to commel, kill commits an act tending to the commission of the killing, tending to the commission of the killing. Um, there's other definitions of this that, that you, because the English language is so, is so uh, variable. Uh, a substantial step in perpetration of the crime. A substantial step in perpetration of the crime, not just in preparation. Ah, so we need an intent to kill and an act tending to the commission of the killing. That's our rule. Those are actually what we call elements of the crime. So let's start to apply this. Let's look at our timeline. Excuse me, Dan. Dan is the one that we're looking at here, right? So Dan is expressing the thought to kill a witness. We know he has an intent to kill. At what point along the timeline will we have that act tending to the commission of the crime? When is he perpetrating the crime versus just preparing for a crime? You can prepare for a crime all day long, but it's until you, you go past that point of, into perpetration. That's where the law steps in. And we want it to step in before Dan kills the witness. And why? Why do we allow attempt crimes in our society? Why do we say it? We don't, we don't want to have to wait until it actually kills the witness. It's what type of crime are attempt crimes? Ashika, please. Um, it be like deliberately or intentionally getting some kind of a weapon or something to harm that person with, with the intention of using it against them? Um, actually, it turns out that in most states, uh, if someone says they want to kill someone and they go to a gun store and buy a gun, that's preparation, not perpetration. Um, but the bigger question here, I think if we take a step back, thank you for that, is that we want to prevent, we want to prevent the target crime. We want to prevent murder. We know murder is, is a crime, and we'll be able to prove that in court. But we don't want to have to wait till Dan actually murders someone, right? Especially if you're that witness, you're hoping that the law can step in, the state can protect you from Dan, can protect that witness from Dan before Dan gets too close. But how close does he have to get? Okay. What if, scenario one, what if Dan follows the witness to work each day and back to W's home? And then one night, Dan parks his car in front of W's home. At that point, and we already know that he's got that intent to kill, so we already have step one, we just need step two. Are these acts, the act of following him back and forth to work and then parking in front of his car, have we gotten close enough to attempted murder? Can he be convicted here? I have a lot of folks on here. Let's hear from someone uh, we haven't heard from. Jessica, good morning. Go ahead. Jessica. Good morning. Would this all fall under like his MO? Um, you're talking about modus operandi, a great yeah. Latin. It seems like an MO, but what we're looking for is do we have what's called in Latin the actus reus? For an attempt crime, attempted murder, we have to have an act that's tending to the commission of the crime. What well, there, 
there's probable cause. There's 50% probable cause because he's stalking. Well, maybe he's guilty of stalking, sure, but we're asking if he's guilty of attempted murder, right? So, so you're saying, okay, perhaps we can bring another crime in here. I'm asking the question, Jessica, has he gotten close enough to killing Dan at this point that he can go to jail for up to 20 years for attempted murder, not for stalking? What do you think, Jessica? No, I don't think it's at the, no. I would okay. Think. Thank you. Uh, we had some other hands here. Stefan, what do you think? Uh, I do not believe at that point he is. Why? I believe he, I, because he he can still make the decision not to proceed. Uh, so it's, it's up until the point where he decides to where he enters a point of no return. Ah, the locus penitentiae, but I can never pronounce another Latin phrase for the point of no return. The point of no return. So you're telling me he has time to change his mind here, and we're hoping he's going to change his mind. We're hoping that his uh, rational thinking component of his brain will will kick in. Thank you. Okay, let's go to another scenario. Now we have, we are knowing he has intent to kill. That's the, what's called the mens rea in criminal law. He also has to have the actus reus. The actus reus is, has he begun to perpetrate instead of just prepare for the crime? So he has intent to kill and he enters the witness's office building to find the witness. He has a gun with him this time, but the witness is not there. Ooh. Have we stepped into the world of perpetration here or is this still preparation? If I'm that witness, I, I might be thinking that uh, I'm hoping the law can step in, but, but I don't know, I wanna hear from you. Um, let's hear from someone that hasn't, hasn't chatted today. So if this was a real law school class, I would actually be cold calling on you. I'd just reach out and call you even if you don't have your hand up. But I'm, uh, Siobhan, please, good morning. Hi there, thank you. Hi. Um, uh, I would still say no. Why not? Because it's an impossibility. Um, even though he went in there to make it happen, uh, Debbie is not there to make it happen. So there can't be attempted murder because there's no victim yet. So Javon, Javon brought up an excellent point. And what she's talking about is the principle of what's called factual impossibility. But guess what? Factual impossibility is not a defense to an attempt crime. And so how the law approaches it, Javon, Javon, is that if the facts had been as defendant believed them to be, if they were as he believed them to be, would he be committing attempted murder? I'll give, I'll slow in, uh, throw in another example here to underscore factual impossibility in that, I, that concept. Um, what if Jack says, I'm gonna kill my wife tonight, grabs his gun, walks into the bedroom, sees the form underneath the sheets that he thinks is his wife, he shoots into, the, he shoots into that form. Turns out that she was on to him, put pillows there and left the house earlier that day. If the facts had been as he believed them to be, he would have been killing his wife. He mm. didn't kill his wife, so therefore he didn't complete the crime, but did he have an intent to kill and did he perpetrate, enter into perpetration? Sure he did. So I love that you brought that up. It's an excellent point. But here it turns on whether or not, did he get close enough? Did he go into the office building thinking he's not there? No, it says to find him, he thinks he's there. Do we okay. want to get any closer? Does that change things for you? Um, it, it still changes that no, it's not attempted murder. He has a gun, he's carrying it. Um, mm -hmm. The fact pattern doesn't say that he drew it oh, so you're or that he fired it. That's that, you know what? You are actually mm -hmm. quoting, great job. You're quoting from a California Supreme Court case from uh, the 1930s. Oh, okay. In which the side <laughs> Said he was a little drunk. He went to a post office and said, I'm going to kill jeans today. A bunch of folks heard him. He took his 22 caliber rifle, walked out to the potato field where Mr. Jeans, his intended victim, was, was working, loads a bullet, but never raises his gun. The intended victim sees him, goes tearing off, and a constable come up, comes over, um, and he just calmly handle, hands his weapon over. And this, the California Supreme Court said, ah, not close enough, he didn't raise his gun. But in today's day and age in which between 1933 or 35 when that case was decided and today we've had a lot of people die by gun by guns, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure our, our court would hold the same thing, but they very much could. And, and what you just said was, was a beautiful example of how close do we have to get because he still had time to do what, Javon? What did he have time to, to do? To stop or change his mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But if we get too close to to the point where he's actually uh, within feet of killing him, if he had been there, 
Ooh, do we want to rest on the hope that he's going to change his mind? That's the tough question here. That's the really tough question. I'm going to go to another fact pattern, make this even, uh, even more tricky. So now what if Dan actually bursts into his private office and immediately fires in the W's chair? But W is not there. So Javon, we already talked about the fact that factual impossibility is not a defense. What do you think? Has he done enough there to show you that he really is going to go through with killing W? At this point, yes. Okay. So at this point, you're like, okay. This yep. Is okay. 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 What, what does everybody else think? Michelle, thank you so much, Javon. Uh, Michelle, Camilla. Thank you. Um, I think at this point, yes, um, because Dan, uh, because W not being there wasn't Dan's choice. His choice was to pull the trigger and shoot. That was what he wanted to do and he did it. So the, perfect. This is what the law actually characterizes as a completed attempt. The law does not require a completed attempts before you can have an attempted murder. Um, but this is an example of one. And what do I mean by completed attempts? I mean, did the defendant take every last step necessary to actually commit the target crime of murder here? Sure, he raised his gun and pulled the trigger, but his dumb luck, the W's dumb luck, was that he, the witness wasn't actually there. But if the facts had been as, as he believed them to be, Dan believed them to be there, believed the witness actually be sitting there, then the witness would have been dead or at least severely injured, right? And right. so the law says, well, if the facts had been as he believed them to be, um, if under those facts he would have been committing that crime, then we've got, we fully have that attempt. So this is a completed attempt. Perfect. Questions on this? Jocelyn, you still had your hand up. Do you have a question on this? Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. Amir. Uh, yes, Professor. My, so my question dates back a little bit earlier. How do we know that Dan had the intent to uh -huh. kill him in the first place? Very smart, very excellent question, because I told you he did. <laughs> <laughs> so I always, often tell my students, don't fight the fact pattern. Which okay. means when the court, because we are because we get our fact patterns from the courts, from, from actual real life decisions, real life cases. I mean, I can't, I can't create things even crazier than what actually happens in real life. So we always take real cases. And the and courts, lower courts will make findings of fact. And those findings are fa of fact are what the appellate courts, the next level courts, are reviewing, right? When they're, when they're actually making an appellate decision, engage in that appellate process. So those findings of fact by law, we don't get to change them. So if the lower court said, he, we found that he had intent to kill, he's yeah. got intent to kill. But Perfect. I would like to work with you on this one for a moment. So let me expand on this a bit because we, I spent an entire week on the issue of mens rea, mental state, intent, what goes on in someone's head. And I often have students, you know, first struggle with, well, how do we ever know what someone really thinks, right? We can't read people's minds. Well, we can look at what someone does. And isn't what someone does actually a pretty good indication often of what they're thinking? If they're a they, reasonable person, yes. Or even if they're an unreasonable person. And how about if they actually tell somebody what they're going to do? Maybe they're going to change their mind. Maybe they were angry. Um, maybe they were just, you know, blowing off steam. So, so you have to be, so we look at what a person says and what they do, and the law gives us this wonderful uh, inference. Uh, it's an inference called natural and probable consequences, which is the law says that the jury can infer that the defendant intended the natural and probable consequences of his actions. I'll let that sit in for a second. That we, the people, can infer that someone actually means to do the natural and probable consequences of what they're doing. What does that mean? Someone picks up a gun and shoots at someone else without saying anything else, just by looking at those actions. Without any other facts given to us, we can infer they intended to kill someone because they're using a deadly weapon in the manner in which it was designed. Why else are you shooting right at somebody if not to kill them? So it often turns out that intent isn't as difficult to, to get to um, than we think. But it can be. And, and that's one of the things we explore throughout criminal law, throughout your first semester. So thank you for bringing up that. Yeah, no, thank you. This is like unlike anything I've ever done. Oh, it's awesome. But it's fun. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's accessible, especially criminal law. Criminal law is an amazing vehicle to help you develop and reinforce critical thinking skills. Asking why. Taking this huge, big issue, the big elephant. I have an elephant in the back of my room here because I do have kids. But that elephant in the back of the room um, reminds me that what we're taking is 
We're taking an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? You know, it's kind of gross. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. The law, law school allows you to take these complex problems that exist all around us in our world, in our community, in our lives, and help solve them by breaking them down into bite-sized manageable chunks. Criminal law, the field of criminal law, provides such a terrific vehicle for learning how to do that because we break everything down into these elements, to these bite-sized chunks. And then we have rules on top of rules we apply to them, but it's a methodology. It's logical. It really helps us get to the essence of what we're looking at. So I'm going to turn to another fact pattern. Is everybody with me? How are we doing? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, my father used to say, false enthusiasm is better than no enthusiasm at all. So fake it till you make it. Um, but I appreciate it. I see a lot of real enthusiasm here this morning. So thank you. Um, I mean, I talk about a lot of very heavy subjects. Uh, I was in the middle of discussing sexual assault and rape crimes the other day with my class and my eight-year-old comes wandering in and says, hey, you talking about sex? I'm like, um, please get out before my head explodes. Uh, so I believe in bringing in humor because the topics we talk about in criminal law are, are incredibly serious, sometimes deadly serious, uh, but we have to be able to laugh and cry about it. So I do bring humor in and enthusiasm. So let's look at these facts, uh, very serious facts. The defendant is on the school bus on his way to school with a gun in his backpack. He has told other students that he plans on shooting up the place and killing students. Unfortunately, this is based on a real fact pattern. The bus is stopped half a mile from school and defendant is arrested on the bus. Learning what we've already learned now is this attempted murder. And again, attempted murder requires intent to kill plus an act in perpetration of the crime, an act tending to show the commission of the crime. What do we think? Someone that hasn't spoken yet today. Don't make me call you out. All right, um, I see. And your name is just one long name on here and it's Sarana Tumasian, which I've completely butchered. I'm so sorry. But Sarah, you can call me Serge. Serge, I can do that. I can do yeah. that. Serge, go ahead. What do you think? Is this a well, the fact that he has told his students that he plans on shooting up the place and killing students, that's that's grounds for an arrest. It's problematic, opinion. but is that a thought crime? Has he gotten anywhere close to doing that crime, to perpetrating it? Close enough? I think that's pretty close. That's a threat. Oh, it's a threat, but there, there, there could be a criminal threat, right? If he can send that's someone right. to But we're asking is, did he attempt murder? Has he attempted murder? No, he hasn't yet. Oh, why not yet? Why not, Serge? Because we haven't seen him pull his gun out, point at people, or any of that. Why, why would those additional acts, additional acts of conduct, be important to you to find attempted murder? In my opinion, if he pulls his gun out and starts pointing at people, that would be pretty close to committing a murder. It would sure look like he's starting to perpetrate the crime instead of prepare it. Right? Exactly. And there's also a temporal dimension. So thank you, Serge. Wonderful. For the thank you. Dimension. I'll go to Kelly. Kelly Meyer. She's up on top of my screen up here. What do you think? I was just going to say, could it, could it be argued that the act of, of getting on the school bus with the gun could be the first step in, in the attempted murder? You sure could. You sure could. Um, is he getting close to it? Or has he done enough because that act coupled with his stated intent? Here we're not just trying to read his mind. He's actually told us what he's thinking. Maybe when someone actually articulates what they want to do, we can move on that spectrum of acts a little bit further back. We don't have to get as close, right? Because what are we really trying to do here with the act? We're trying to use his acts to prove that he really is going to go through with it, to prove his mental state. This is higher level criminal law, but you already have been, been completely jumping right into it and, and, and comprehending it. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And what does he, but what does he still have time to do? Um, uh, Renee, Mithin, please. Mithlin. Good morning. Um, he still has time to change his mind, but I was wondering, is this more like a premeditated that he has oh, the tools? Yeah. Uh -huh. he, he's, he's told people this is his plan um, but we know that he hasn't, he hasn't attempted it yet, mm -hmm. but it's he's devised the whole plan for it. And if he actually went through with it, it would probably be premeditated first degree murder, which is the highest level murder we have. It takes intent to kill and it adds a couple of other ingredients to it. 
um, Renee, as you've, as you've accurately identified. It adds planning, which is premeditation, um, that small element. It adds deliberation. Once someone that considers and reflects upon the consequences of killing and decides to do it anyway, we say that that is more morally culpable. That, that provides more moral blameworthiness than someone that just decides in a split second they're gonna kill and they kill someone. They're still morally blameworthy. That's second degree intent to kill murder. But we reserve greater punishment for those with greater moral culpability. And we as society have decided that if someone plans a murder and reflects on the consequences of killing and then goes through it with it anyway, they get, they get a greater punishment. So Renee, thank you for bringing those up. Thank sure, you for bringing those up. Thank you. No, that was a terrific point. Anyone else on this one? Siobhan, go ahead. Your hand is still up. Or is that from before? Siobhan? Oh, sorry. That was from... Okay, no, that's... that. I want to ensure that everyone, we take gets, it a chance to, everyone gets a chance to speak. Thank you. That wants to. <laughs> Stefan, was that from before? Uh, no, no, it's on this case. So uh, just, just in my opinion, I don't even think this one comes close to attempted murder. Um, I mean, I think at most they would have uh, not even brandishing a weapon, just holding, you know, maybe carrying a, without a permit. I think that's all he has. I think or for him to be threat. maybe criminal threat, right? But it, it, that's only if he made it a threat at the time he was doing something and towards those person. If he told somebody out of anger the day before to some friends, and then I don't even consider this a threat at this point. Stefan, you bring up terrific points. This is actually loosely based on a, on a real case in Vermont in which a young man um, said he wanted to kill others at a school. He was going to shoot it up. He actually acquired one gun, said he was going to acquire others. Um, and he was arrested um, before he ever actually engaged in, any, in it, uh, a violent act in the courts. And he was convicted, but then it was overturned on appeal. And they said that was not attempted murder because he had been preparing, but not yet perpetrating. Preparing so to me, this the, the arrest was proper because it served the purpose of saving, potentially saving lives. There was a probability he would have gone to do so. But at the same time, they can't, I don't think they can win a case against him on, on all those facts. Ah, but the police don't get to arrest people just to prevent crimes. They can only arrest individuals if they have probable cause that the individual either committed or is in the commission of a crime. What is probable cause? The Supreme Court's defined it pretty low. It's a mere probability, but they've also defined it as where a reasonable person, right? A reasonable person would think the facts and circumstances show that he's in fact committing a crime here. And I think a lot of folks here just said he wasn't committing a crime yet. So there, so the the individual, the police would have to have probable cause of another another crime, like a threat, uh, perhaps criminal threat, perhaps carrying the weapon. Well, carrying the um, weapon appears mm -hmm. that he has that. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So. I'm going to show this slide because I think this is what this is. We're really getting to the point that it reflects that there are a variety of approaches across this great country of ours. We have over we have 50 states, and but we have more than 50. We have over well over 50 criminal jurisdictions. What do I mean by that? Um, our founding fathers, uh, in the in the concept of federalism, divided our country, as you all know, uh, between a federal government and state governments. The primary responsibility for law enforcement, for keeping we the people safe, is vested in the states. Um, so states predominantly take care of criminal law and ex pass criminal law, make it, legislate it, execute it via our law and for local law enforcement, and then um, interpret it via our courts. So states, we have 50 states, plus we have the federal criminal jurisdiction, plus we have the federal military criminal jurisdiction, in which I practice, and we have territories, right? Each of all of these various uh, uh, jurisdictions have differing approaches, take differing approaches to attempt law. You do not learn them all in law school. I give you a very general approach, the general approach under the, what's called the common laws, what's on the bar exam. Um, but we also dive deeper into California in my class because we live in California. Most of you are going to practice in California and we want to know what's going on and be able to explain it to our, to our family and friends around us. So different states have different approaches. Some states require that that act with, once you have the guilty mind, that, that guilty act, some of them require to be pretty darn close to the completed attempt. They would be with Javon, who earlier wanted, wanted, uh, wanted Dan to actually be raising the gun up before he could be convicted of attempted murder. Some states take that approach. They say, oh, we want it to be really close. Other states have shifted to the left and said, ooh, we don't, it doesn't have to be as close. There's a, a, a model, what's called the model penal code you'll learn about. Uh, this, this, 
body of law that are that are draft provisional um, ideal laws per se uh, that a bunch of law professors uh, prosecutors judges got together they started drafting this in the in the 60s um, they came together and said if we could just rewrite criminal law across the United States what would we look what, how what would we make it into um, then they draft then they published you know a, a complete comprehensive li list of laws of ideal laws no states ever adopted all of them but some states have followed components of it and under this model penal code the model penal code defines an attempt the actus reus as a substantial step in commission of the crime that is strongly corroborative of the actor's mental state that doesn't sound that different until you get to the rest of that little provision and the, the little provision that gives actual examples of conduct that they say conclusively will be held as legally sufficient for an attempt. One of them is if uh, being in the area of the crime, of the co contemplated crime with the tools necessary to complete it. Therefore, under the model penal code, Dan, the minute he walked into that building, the office building where the witness worked with his gun, under a model penal code approach, that would be enough for attempted murder. So I bring this up to show that there are various approaches. Um, we do have a few more minutes. I do want to ask, what approach do you do you like better? Do you want to wait for the law, uh, wait for the actor, the defendant to actually have gotten really close to perpetrating it before the law steps in, or do you want the law to be able to push it back? And if and why? Um, Ashika, please. Um, so I actually have a, a question on that before I answer the question. Perfect, go ahead. Um, so on the school bus, um, was, is the ambiguity of that student's statement um, problematic? Like, cause it said, he just said shooting up the place and that doesn't necessarily mean he has to step foot into the school, it could be the bus. Um, so under that, that code that you just told us about, could that ambiguity um, work against him and could they arrest him because he just said the place? Um, I think that ambiguity would come into play um, before trier of fact, whether or not they decided that that was sufficient to show he actually had intent to kill, that because the government would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt he had intent to kill. And so having a gun along with those statements would seem to reinforce intent to kill, but the government always has that incredibly high burden. And that's one of the things we talk about in my class and in all criminal law classes, why the government has such a high burden. Um, it's because of the presumption of innocence, which is usually nested under the due process clause of the, uh, the Bill of Rights of the US Constitution. But it's, but it's this idea that we are presumed innocent and before the government can take away our life or liberty, because the government can take away our life with enough due process, um, because we still do have a death penalty in this country, um, before the government takes away our life or liberty, uh, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant actually committed the crime. And so but, but here in the United States, we've made the trade off as society that it's better for 10 guilty men or women to go free than one innocent person to go to jail. So we have, so we set the standard incredibly high beyond a reasonable doubt. So I think that's where that ambiguity would come in is when you're looking at it, does that cast a reasonable doubt? Um, great question, Mike. Yeah, good morning, and thank you for hosting this event. We appreciate it. Um, this is fun. Um, I think that we should allow people every opportunity to uh, back out of decisions, like up until the last moment. Um, you think about that kid on the school bus, like um, maybe he was being braggadocious. Uh, maybe he didn't understand what he was saying. I don't know how old the kid was, but um, we, we should give him every opportunity to change his mind before um, taking them into custody, I guess. Oh, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that comment. And I would like to highlight here, and this is something that I've woven throughout my criminal law class, and I also teach criminal procedure, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a driving theme in the class, and that is a crime like attempt crimes gives law enforcement quite a bit of discretion for when to step in, because a step, an act in perpetration of the crime, and, and we're still here sitting here struggling, and courts often struggle, how much of an act is enough? Um, discretion can be a good thing, but discretion can also be a huge Mack truck to bring what into the equation. And what does law enforcement, unfortunately, on occasion bring into, as all human beings do, because as human beings, we all have these, uh, Javon? Biases. Biases. Can you hear me? Yeah, biases. biases. 100%. Mm -hmm. We all as human beings have what are called cognitive biases, biases that we're not even aware of. 
And unfortunately, there are members of our community that also have overt biases, right? And so if the greater amount of discretion in the law, the greater amount of an opportunity for biases to come in. You counteract biases with education and training. Um, but that is one is a concern here. If you bring it too far to the left, who are the individuals that law enforcement will be stepping in that early to, to incarcerate? Um, that's something to consider and to think about. And that is something that we do talk a lot about in the classroom. Where do these rates of mass incarceration come from? Why is that? Um, and, and the racial complexities involved in that as well. And disparities, right? The inequalities. So that is something that, even though we are talking about fundamental principles of criminal law in my class, um, I cannot do it and I will not do it. We're completely divorced from the greater context, which is our criminal justice system. Um, so it's fun. So let's have one last example, fun, challenging, serious, relevant, 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 and giving you the tools, you the tools to be the change agents that you want to be, that you already are, but an even better, more effective change agent. Um, so this is a real case. Uh, so as Dean Prager mentioned, I, I, uh, I think maybe she didn't mention, I also teach national security law. So national security laws runs the gamut of from everything from federal criminal law, dealing with treason, dealing with the federal crime of material support to terrorism, to talking about uh, the laws of armed conflict, um, which are international humanitarian law, laws regulating the battlefield, uh, up to the UN charter re regulating uh, use of force. So I do often bring in some of those, um, some of those themes into my criminal law, not often, but sometimes in criminal law. So here's a case from uh, more of the national security world, but dealing with criminal law, so Mohammed Hamza Khan, who's 19, uh, was arrested as he was ready to board. He was at Chicago O'Hare. He was arrested as he was ready to board a flight to Istanbul via Vienna. Um, and via email chats with a, what turned out to be an FBI agent, he said that he wanted to join ISIS. And 18 USC 2339B criminalizes um, both providing material support to terrorism as well as attempting to provide material support to terrorism um, with up to 20 years per count for either attempt or actually completed material support to terrorism. Um, do you think he actually was committing uh, attempted material support to terrorism just by getting on the flight in conjunction with the fact that he had emailed an FBI agent that he didn't know it was an FBI agent, he thought it was an ISIS member, um, that he was flying to, to uh, Turkey to uh, then cross over to Syria to join ISIS? What do you think? So this, this, bringing it, making it real. Um, Chris. Um, I think at that point, it's still just too ambiguous. Uh, ambiguous. Why? Uh, because he could be saying that, but have other motives. Um, and he doesn't, well, yeah, we don't know like his motives behind what he's saying uh, to talk, for talking to that guy or behind the act. So Chris, there is a difference between motives, why we do something, and what are order called mental states in the law. So here, his letters, let's assume that that shows he had intent to join ISIS. They actually had the intent. Now we're looking at that same issue of was this act enough? Was this an act in preparation? Or is he perpetrating? Is he about, is he stepping over that line of no return? Um, Amir, please. Um, I would have to respectfully disagree with Chris on this one. And I do think that he is crossing that line into perpetration. And the only reason I do say this is that he's leaving the United States and to commit this act. And then, then he will once again be able to come back into the States. So the court system and the government, though there may be CIA overseas, uh, CIA overseas doesn't have the jurisdiction to prevent this to the extent that they would if they prevented him versus having him go to Istanbul, go to Syria, and then come back stateside. Thank you. Um, it turns out he wound up uh, pleading guilty uh, to this. Um, he got a uh, much lower uh, jail time, uh, jail sentence than most material support to terrorism crimes do. And I think it was largely due to the fact he was cooperated greatly with the authorities. Um, so he got three years, but 20 years of, uh, of uh, mandatory supervision. Um, and he'd already, he's already served his, his three years. Okay, so this in a microcosm in a very condensed manner. So thank you so much for your 45 minutes. This is the life of a law student. So learning, practicing, uh, getting the motivation or the further motivation to go out in the world and make a difference um, through engagement, through critical thinking, through applying what we're learning to real life 
problem. This isn't about real life. There's a lot of theory involved, but theory informs real life and helps us understand what's going on uh, out the outside. So I want to thank you so, so, so much for all of your attention. I think I, uh, I don't think I have time for anything. I think I'm over time. Uh, I love what I do. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a uh, occupational hazard. If, I, if you say I can teach, I'll keep teaching. So thank you so much. Who's, uh, who's taking over for me? Thank you so much. Let's all unmute and give a huge round of applause to Professor Van Landingham. I just want to see you guys here next year, okay? We want to see you too. Thank you. Yeah, we want to see you too. Thank you. Feel free to email me. I email you back. Sometimes it takes a few days. I get like 2,000 emails right now in my email box. But my email is online. We all have public web pages. Um, on our Southwestern Law School site, and I'd be happy to ask, ask, answer any questions or put you in contact with some of the um, some more fabulous students. So best of luck today. Thank you, Professor Garakamia. Thank you so much, Professor Van Landingham. This was absolutely fantastic um, and a really great lead in to our next segment, which is a panel of a couple of current students and a couple of really distinguished alums. Um, I know that the class has been incredibly engaging and there's been so much participation and energy, but I can also appreciate if anybody wants to kind of just stand up and, you know, do a little bit of stretch um, as we move into our next segment. So please go ahead, take a minute, um, take care of whatever is going to give you a nice break before we get started. Um, we are going to go into our panel for about 45 minutes, which I'll moderate, um, and then we're going to leave time at the end for questions that you might have. So many of you have already been putting in excellent questions in the chat, um, and a lot of them have been handled and being responded to um, with so much insight and great information by our student ambassadors, Arman Avakian and Emily Tori. Um, but we're going to continue answering those questions through this panel that we have. All right, we'll get started. So we have two current students, Alex Welfringer and Vanessa Barnett, and we have two alums, Karen Aguilar and Michael Morse joining us. I'm going to be posing questions to them. Some questions will only be posed to one or two members of our panel, others to everybody. Um, and as I said, please jot down your questions, keep track of them so at the end you can pose them to our panelists. They won't be able to respond to you during the course of the panel. To get us started, um, just a reminder what the point of this session is. It's to give you a glimpse into the arc of being a successful law student and then into practice, being a successful and satisfied attorney. And already just participating in this program, I can tell you that you're well on your way to being a su successful law student. There's so much to learn about law school and what legal education entails and what opportunities the JD holds for you. But it's really smart of you to be proactive and participate in a program like this, to ask the kind of questions that you were asking, to engage with the class as Professor Van Landingham was teaching. And then this next segment is also to show you that the JD degree is so incredibly versatile. There's so much that you could do with your JD degree, um, including starting off with one career path and then deciding you wanna change, pivot to something else. And many of you in the chat were asking whether you need to know coming into law school, um, what area of law you're interested in. And the answer is no. I mean, wonderful if you have some areas of interest, but law school is going to present you with so much interesting stuff, so many interesting leads. Um, just as so many of you were uh, reacting to Professor Van Landingham's class and how much you loved it, and now you're interested in criminal law. That's what law school is going to do for you, and that's what you're going to hear from our four speakers. Um, the arc of getting to law school, what law school's like, and then post-graduation. So I'm gonna start by asking our panelists to introduce themselves. 
uh, share a little bit first about their background. It's nicer to hear it coming from them. And then I'll start with the questions. And um, we'll start with our current students, Alex, and then Vanessa, and then we'll go to Karen and Michael, and I'm going to be using first names. I hope it's fine with everybody. So Alex. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a scale one, so I'm in the accelerated program. Um, we're just now finishing period two, so I'm a baby law student. Um, I came to law school after getting my bachelor's in business, and then I also have my master's in business. Um, but I want to be a criminal prosecutor, so I came to law school and I am loving it. So I highly recommend coming. Thanks, Alex. Vanessa? Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Barnett. I am a 4L evening student, so I am at the end of my journey. <laughs> it's been amazing. It's been incredible, but um, I'm, I'm happy that there is some light at the end of the tunnel, which also happens to be the beginning of the tunnel, but we'll get into that later. Um, I am someone who came to law school a little bit later. I got my undergraduate degree from Howard University. And um, that was in English. I had spent some time as an entertainment journalist and now here I am at law school to become an entertainment attorney. Thank you, Vanessa. Karen? Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Aguilar and I am a removal defense attorney at the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. Uh, that's a nonprofit that has offices throughout the state of California. And my focus uh, is really removal. It used to be known as deportation. And so I defend the rights um, of non-citizens who are in these proceedings before immigration court. Uh, I graduated from Southwestern in 2014. And I am now also an adjunct professor for the public interest externship course. Thank you. And Michael. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here. Um, let's see, I, I, I'll start from the beginning. I, I went to law school a little bit later in life um, as well. It was kind of a second career for me um, before law school. I worked at a bank, uh, which is, of course, incredibly altruistic um, in, in terms of that endeavor. Um, I ended up going back to school and I started law school um, the day after my 30th birthday. Um, at law school, I, um, I kind of knew I wanted to be a prosecutor, um, but once I got to law school, I started taking a lot of criminal law classes and stuff like that, and I was always kind of rooting for the defendant in each case, so then I wanted to be a public defender, um, so I kind of went back and forth on that. I ended up um, being involved in our trial advocacy honors program, which is like a mock trial program. Did a bunch of stuff with that. I did some teaching assisting in the criminal law area ended up graduating and um, going to the uh, LA County District Attorney's Office. I prosecuted cases there for about six years, kind of ran the gamut between like misdemeanor cases all the way up to like murder cases. Um, the last <clears throat> unit that I was in at the LA County DA's office was kind of like, you may think of it as an SVU unit and that we prosecute mostly domestic violence, uh, sex crimes, tr uh, crimes against children and, and the elderly. Um, I recently left that office and, then, and now I'm an assistant U.S. attorney in the Central District of California, which is basically the Los Angeles office. So I'm still a prosecutor, but now I'm pro prosecuting federal cases. Uh, so similar to what I was doing before, but a different area of law. Thank you, Michael. So I'm going to pose my first question to our established alums. Um, as an established attorney, um, what's a recent case or a matter that you've worked on that would convey to a prospective student um, why becoming an established expert attorney is so satisfying and why your work is so important? Uh, Karen or Michael, whoever wants to go first. I can talk about um, just my most recent uh, trial that I had in June and I uh, loosely call it trial just because the proceedings are within the administrative body of the EOIR. Um, but I represented an immigration court, a, uh, a refugee from Cuba, uh, who um, over the course of several years uh, was tortured uh, by the police in a very small town um, for voicing his political opinion 
uh, and his political opinion was pretty much against the, 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 the communist government of Cuba. And uh, we had evidence of, of, of the fact that he was detained. Um, we had evidence of the fact that he was tortured and he lawfully entered the United States through a port of entry. He sought asylum, but the way that our laws work, um, he was detained in Adelanto detention facility for six months. And uh, this is a man who has no criminal record, had never stepped foot in a jail. And I decided to take his case pro bono uh, after he had looked for an attorney for several months to represent him. And uh, this was also right in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And he was scared for his life. I was scared for my own, um, but I still showed up at court in the detention facility. And uh, after uh, you know, four hours of testimony, uh, we prevailed and he was released the following day. Uh, and now he is working and I get text messages from him uh, every other two weeks about how grateful he is to be released and to be free and to feel safe uh, and to have been embraced by this country. That's very moving. And then also when you think about the ripple effect of what you did for this person and what it means for their family, their community. Michael? Um, I guess the case that sticks out to me is one of the last trials that I did um, at the LA County DA's office. It was a case involving a victim who had a nine-year-old daughter at the time um, before the incident that brought us to trial. She had made it kind of struck up a, a fast friendship with someone that she had met online uh, who was out of state. He ends up being our defendant in the case. Um, they kind of create a friendship, a close friendship. Uh, he ends up staying at uh, her home for a period of time because he was, according to him, down on his luck. She takes him in, kind of lets him sleep on the couch. He develops an affinity for her, an attachment to her, wants to be romantic with her. She rebuffs him. He eventually leaves her home and then begins to uh, kind of harass her over text message, um, repeated phone calls, threatening her. And all of this sort of culminates um, in a evening on New Year's Eve where he and one of his accomplices come in and kick down uh, the victim's door, um, assault the daughter and the, uh, physically assault the daughter and the uh, victim, dragged her out by her hair all the way to her vehicle. And um, luckily before they drove off with the victims, a uh, good Samaritan um, intervened. He ended up getting charged for kidnapping, residential burglary and criminal threats. Um, there was a period of time before the case actually came to sort of the DA's office attention where the victim was very uncooperative or not sort of willing to, to tell us what happened. Uh, she eventually did kind of let us know everything that was going on. What we discovered was that uh, the defendant was uh, at that time an active kind of gang member and a lot of people, members of his gang had been intimidating her. Uh, we were able to intercept some phone calls um, where he was calling her from jail, essentially telling her, don't tell the police what happened, otherwise like people in my gang are gonna take action. So that's how we ended up finding out that maybe she wasn't telling us the truth. And uh, my detective and I kind of sat with her and, and you know played the call for her and eventually she breaks down and she starts crying and she tells us what's going on. We end up filing the case. Uh, we take it all the way to trial. Even during the trial, she was being threatened um, by the, we believe to be members of the gang and all the, at the point where we get up to the jury trial and she's testifying even, um, you know, I'm in the middle of the testimony with her talking to her about what's going on and she just stops and freezes and she won't continue. We take a recess. She tells me that there's somebody in the audience that she recognizes, one of the defendant's friends who's a gang member. Um, I go sidebar with the judge, tell the judge what's happening. I end up actually calling this person who was in the gallery to the stand um, to ask him what he was doing there, you know, which the judge was like, I was like, hey, judge, I want to call somebody who's sitting in the gallery. And the judge is like, who, what's this person's name? And I'm like, I don't know, but we're about to find out because I think he's intimidating my, my witness here and I want the jury to see it. We put him on the stand. Hey, who are you? What are you doing here? Do you know the defendant? And it became clear that he was there on behalf of the uh, defendant to intimidate our witness. Um, she ends up, or the defendant ends up getting convicted and um, you know, just the conversations that I had with her and her daughter after the fact, and like Corinne was saying, we kind of kept in contact after the trial and kind of the, the, the weight that was lifted off of their lives as, as I saw it and as they saw it 
it's, this job is about, or I should say this job in the law is uh, in terms of its impactfulness, it impacts real people. Um, you know, you really have an opportunity to change real people's lives, um, no matter what area of law you're in, whether it be immigration or criminal law, um, if it's criminal defense, um, you know, I could talk about cases all day, I'm sure Corinne could as well, but you know, some of the cases that stick out to me, which you know, I have enough time to go into here, are cases when I was able to find out maybe his criminal defendant didn't do the crime. Um, cases where I began to go on sort of investigative mission to prove that the defendant was innocent, or at least innocent of the top charge and maybe of something lesser he was guilty of. Um, those are some of the most satisfying cases for me when we're able to let somebody out who, who should be out. Um, so I'd say big picture, you know, uh, being able to impact people's lives through the law um, and that sort of emotional uh, connection uh, or at least satisfaction that you can get knowing that you were able to do that, you know, that all of your years of study in school were not in vain in that sense that you have that satisfaction. I think that's what sticks out to me about this job and more broadly the practice of law. So before I um, turn to Alex and Vanessa with some questions, Karen and um, Michael, I just wanted to follow up with you in terms of these really important impactful cases that you talked about um, and pretty complex cases. Um, and you've been out of law school for a long time now. And of course, there's been a lot of experience through your years of practice that have prepared you to get to this point. But if you can think back as to a foundation that Southwestern gave you that has set you on this course, that's equipped you to handle these kinds of very serious, very complicated cases um, and handle them well, what would you identify as, as a foundation, as a skill, as a character attribute that Southwestern has given you or instilled in you? Um, okay, I'll jump in. So I would say one of the things, I think the instruction at Southwestern that I received, um, I thought it was superior in nature. Um, I mean, I still, you know, in, when you're doing trials, there comes a time at the end of a trial that a prosecutor and a defense attorney have to explain the law to the jury and you're literally explaining the law. You almost take on this professorial role to the jury because you have to explain the law that they're gonna to use to decide the issues in the case. And I still describe some of the general principles of the law and the way that my criminal law professor um, described them and you know, even some of her mannerisms because that's how much they, stick, they stuck in my mind. Um, so the quality of instruction, I think the intangibles that I thought that some of the professors at, law, at uh, Southwestern had, um, you know, conveying information is one thing, but conveying it in a way that's persuasive and memorable, um, and so that it conceptually sort of sticks um, is, a, is a whole other matter. And I thought that, uh, especially in the, the common, the core classes, which you're gonna experience in your first and some of you in your second years, depending on what program you, you, you get into or you, you opt to be in, um, I thought laid the foundation for me in terms of the law. And so, you know, even today, when I'm approaching a new issue of law, I, I kind of lean back on, on that aspect of it. And the second thing I would say is just the sort of collegial and supportive environment that Southwestern um, encouraged. It's certainly from the faculty and staff, but all the way down to the to the to your colleagues, to my colleagues, to the, to the students. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and this kind of harkens back to what we were talking about in the first question. This job is about people. Um, you know, you're, we're not you're not going to be legal machines. You're going to be attorneys dealing with real parties with real controversies, so real people with real problems. And um, that's not just about writing the best legal argument. That's not just about making the best legal argument. That's about being persuasive because you know even your judges are people, opposing counsel is people, your colleagues are people. And so I think Southwestern did a good job of weighing both the human and the sort of that comes with being a successful lawyer. Um, because at the end of the day, you're gonna be a colleague as well. You're gonna be, uh, have a reputation that will precede you, not just with respect to how versed you are in the law, but in terms of how ethical you are 
and how uh, helpful you are and how collegial you are um, and how gracious you are. And those things Southwestern exemplified in my mind. And, and, and I can say that with some degree of um, confidence because I interacted with people um, who were you know, contemporaries of mine who went to other law schools and not all of them had that same experience. Uh, and so it's kind of show it sometimes. Uh, we always talk about this idea of coming from a happy home with Southwestern. Um, I had that foundation. So I'd say the, the weight between the human component, because you're not, you know, you're not gonna be successful as a lawyer unless you, you can get that and, and um, work on that. Um, Southwestern allowed me to do that. And then also the uh, academic component. So the weight of those two things, I think it still today helps me um, get through cases and talk to people who I haven't have a different perspective with and so on. For me, um, one of the things that I think laid a foundation uh, as to how I practice law um, is really the exposure that Southwestern gave me in this area. Uh, unlike uh, Michael, uh, you know, I only took one year off between undergraduate school and Southwestern Law School. And my whole life, I actually grew up uh, cleaning office buildings side by side with my mother who was a janitor. And so for me, being in an office setting or sitting behind the desk was actually something foreign. Uh, I didn't have office skills. And so it was at Southwestern uh, through the externship and the internship opportunities that I was first exposed to this professional setting where uh, I was forced to develop new skill set. And so it started very early, you know, with internships at Learning Rights Law Center, uh, with having internships and externships in federal government agencies, like the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the United States Department of Labor, um, and eventually being a full-time extern for uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, before the late uh, Honorable uh, Harry Pregerson. And so for me, it, this exposure and these opportunities, these doors that were opened by the faculty at Southwestern is what built my confidence. And it helped me envision myself as an attorney. And I think that was very important as, especially for me as a, as a woman who is the first in my family to ever step foot in a school. My parents didn't have even elementary education. And so um, Southwestern helped me dream um, and it helped me and it put me in the spaces. Um, that eventually uh, led to this career. So I, I think that's one of the things that set the foundation. It's building of confidence just through this exposure that I didn't have and that I never really knew that I would. Um, another thing that Southwestern did for me uh, is that it taught me the importance of being a diligent attorney. Um, I you know, through, for example, the immigration law clinic, one of the things that was uh, strongly emphasized uh, by, you know, Professor Vasquez is becoming familiar with the rule of law. And there's just no way around that. Um, I think that the strongest and the best attorneys are the ones who can find answers, break down and digest complex areas of law. And for me, even though I do rely on, on a community of practitioners, uh, to bounce ideas, uh, to share strategy, uh, it starts with me. I, I, do the, I do the research on my own. I read statute on my own. I read case law on my own. I read policy. Uh, I read memorandas. I read um, you know, form instructions. It starts with me. And that's something that I feel was ingrained in my education to be a problem solver and to be the person who finds answers for yourself. Um, and so I think it's that diligence as an attorney that has carried me through um, in this practice of law. And, and I have been uh, practicing immigration now um, for, I'm going into my third year. Um, and despite the, the climate, um, I have never lost a case. And, and, and I say that with, with a lot of, uh, just a lot of happiness, because I know that all the work that I put in and all of the things that my professor stressed during the time of, of you know, that I was at Southwestern for those three years, um, it's all paying off. It's all coming back full circle. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Karen. Everything that you shared in terms of your journey and the components that helped you get, get there and the work that you're doing is really, really inspirational. 
um, and kind of the roadmap that you've laid out um, is one that's tough and needs a lot of self-direction and commitment and requires hard work, um, but certainly one that can be achieved. So let's go back and now start with our current students and hear from Alex and Vanessa as they've started this journey um, towards becoming established attorneys um, to share with us, you know, something recent in your law school experience that you think would convey to a prospective student. Um, what is so exciting or fulfilling or worth it with respect to all the hard work that you're putting in at this point? Um, and maybe we start with Alex, you're in your first year, and then we'll go to Vanessa, who is in her last year and looking forward to wrapping up. <laughs> um, yes, so I am in my first year. So I have only been in law school for a little over four and a half months. Um, so not very long, but in scale, you move quickly, um, which I highly recommend scale. And if anybody has questions, please let me know and I would be happy to answer them. But one thing that I've noticed about Southwestern and specifically our skill program is that you learn by doing. So we sit in class specifically, I'm in evidence right now. And evidence is a tough subject. It's a lot of rules that you have to know verbatim and it's tough stuff. But we have the opportunity to do these evidence labs, um, which is essentially a mock trial where you have co-counsel and you are um, arguing in front of a judge against opposing counsel on why a piece of evidence should or should not be admissible. And it's usually kind of up in the air if it should be or shouldn't be. And the most rewarding experience I have had so far is I thought I had a loser case. I thought there's no way my client's gonna get this evidence inadmissible. And I was able to keep every single piece of evidence from coming in against my client. And my client was ultimately exonerated from the crime. And just that moment of realizing that you're sitting in class and reading these cases and it's a lot of work and it's time consuming and draining at times but then when you are able to apply it and see, like reap the benefit of all of your hard work it is so rewarding and so worth it thanks alex vanessa uh, for me, I think um, listening to Korean talk about exposure, I really connect with that because that's what my experience at Southwestern has been and that's what makes it exciting and thrilling and, and worth it, worth all of the hard work. And when I speak about exposure, it really is um, the opportunity to try different things under that legal umbrella to really figure out where your passions are, where your strengths are, and each and every person in our community, they really rally and champion you to figure out those paths. And so for me, it's been um, joining the negotiation honors program. As an evening student, you almost don't even, you, you come in not knowing what you can do and how far you can stretch yourself and what you can be a part of because you have so many things in your life that you come to the table with. Like outside of law school, everything just feels so full, but you get here and, and being able to be a part of that honors program, um, challenged me in new ways, but also showed me a passion for negotiation. And earlier this year, we, uh, my partner and I, we competed in the um, ABA national competition and placed first. And that was, I can't even tell you how amazing that experience was for me and how before even coming to law school, I couldn't have even put that on a vision board. That wasn't even a vision I had. And to be able to execute it with the help of our um, faculty, of our directors from NHP, from administration, everyone just really wants you to win. And they don't push you in a path, they, they help you like flourish in what path you set for yourself. And um, it just has been such an amazing experience. And even outside of NHP, trying things that um, I didn't know if they would be a passion, being a part of the removal defense clinic. You know, you live in LA and there are people in my life um, that are affected by decisions um, that come through removal defense. And to be a part of that clinic um, was a was a experience that I never thought I would have because my path was entertainment. 
by being able to be hands-on with the clinic. You're hands-on with clients. You see people face-to-face, you hear their experiences and you are tasked with helping them through something that is so difficult and dark in their lives. And you see that the hard work that you put into it our victories for people, our, our chances at hope are just moments in their life that they are just so incredibly thankful for. And that's what Southwestern offers. It offers you hands-on experience. It gives you exposure to honors programs, to clubs, to people that you would never meet. And everyone really wants you to be your best self, whatever that looks like. And I could not have asked for a better experience or to be introduced to better people than what I've had at Southwestern. Thank you both. So um, the two of you, Alex and Vanessa, but also Michael, Karen, I mean, you've talked about so much that you did when you were in law school. Um, but I am guessing that for prospective students, all of this could feel very, very exciting, but also somewhat daunting and overwhelming. So if you could kind of put yourselves back into that mindset of, you know, as you're applying to law school, as you're getting ready to start, what helps you acclimate into law school? You know, what helped you? What did you do maybe the summer before or as you started your coursework? What about Southwestern, the programming or, you know, what you were doing in terms of your own kind of life management that was helpful? So to hear from Alex and then Manessa, but also um, Michael and Karen, it would be interesting to hear from you too. Um, Alex? Well, I was in your shoes not too long ago. Um, so I remember the daunting and anxiety very well. Um, I wanna tell you that your grades and your LSAT score are very important, but they're not everything. So if you don't do that well in the LSAT, don't count yourself out. I did horrible on the LSAT. I bombed it. I did terrible. And I'm in law school and I'm doing great. And your LSAT score does not determine how well or what your grades will be in law school. So just to put that out there. Um, as far as getting acclimated, um, I've had a different experience than probably the other panelists because my entire law school career has been online um, amidst the pandemic. So that brought its own level of anxiety. And um, I've never taken online classes before, like probably most of you. Um, so learning to learn online was a, it was tough. It was a tough transition um, that everybody had to go through, the professors, faculty, staff. So give everybody a little bit of a break, be easy on yourself. It's, it's a tough transition, but I think if you just take it one day at a time, get every like, write out your calendar. That's like the biggest thing you'll hear as a law student is time block, write out all your assignments, plan out your week in advance and check things off one at a time. Start really small and then check things off one at a time and you can accomplish it. Um, yes, yeah, scheduling is huge. I will second that. Um, for me, uh, when I decided to go to law school, I had just had my second child. And so setting for the LSAT, um, I almost quit. I didn't think I could do it because I would be um, you know, up with my son nursing through the night and trying to study for the LSAT and falling asleep. And I told myself, if you can't even study for the LSAT, how will you be successful in law school? Um, and I don't know what propelled me. I, I, I have huge amounts of faith. So that was a big part of it. But um, having a support system was integral for me with uh, two kids. I still work full time. Um, my husband has been just incredibly supportive, but I've also had to call out to other people. My, my mom moved to LA. <laughs> um, my best friends are there when I need them. It really is. Um, uh, it was really a humbling experience because I'm someone who throughout the majority of my life um, felt uncomfortable asking for help, but being in law school forced me to seek support wherever I could. And that even means professors. I reach out to them quite often. I'm emailing, I'm discussing where I am and, and just looking for guidance um, whenever I feel like things are overwhelming. And so um, 
I think scheduling really helps acclimate yourself um, and just be um, understanding and what you can accomplish. Do not compare yourself to others. Um, I laugh when I say that and when I used to hear it because there is, an, a, a, there is a part of law school that is competition, you know, you're ranked. You, we, can't, <laughs> we can't act like that doesn't feel competitive. But when I say don't compare yourself to others, it's because um, your situation is unique to you. And so for me with kids and a job and trying to be active on campus and, and, and picking up an externship over the summer and trying to really build a, a really uh, robust law school career, um, I had to have grace with myself and understand what I was, um, what I could accomplish, what I had capacity for, and what I needed to set boundaries with. And so that changes too. What it looked like my 1L year doesn't look, isn't exactly the same as it looked my 4L year. Um, I did have the luxury of starting with a little bit of an online component. Uh, Southwestern is amazing in that way that they were ahead of the curve. Um, they really looked at the evening program and realized that it was more beneficial for students that work all day to um, have that option to do online classes in conjunction with being on campus. Um, so the transition to online was still difficult. <laughs> There's a pandemic, but um, we had a little bit of footing in that arena, but it completely upended my schedule. My kids are homeschooling. I'm, I'm schooling them while schooling myself and, and still working. So um, the schedule shifts, the schedule changes, be okay with that. Understand when it's not working and why, and just be flexible with yourself and be kind to yourself. My therapist taught me that, be kind to yourself. <laughs> Please take that and use it. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of what I did before I started law school, um, I just kind of sat around and I was hand wringing for the entire summer wondering what, what, would, uh, what I would encounter when I got to law school. Um, so I don't know that I did anything particularly useful um, between the time that I knew I was going to start and the time that I actually started. But I would say big picture, um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of what Vanessa was saying there at the end, you know, when you get to law school, everybody's smart, if you will, um, because they're in law school, you know, and there can be a tendency to uh, compare yourself to others. Uh, on the one hand, coming to law school intellectually, your world is about to be enlarged. On the other hand, your world is about to shrink really, really small because it's just all about law school, you know? And so when you're kind of on that track running and there are others running alongside you, or you may interpret them or believe them to be ahead of you or even behind you, whatever the case is, you have a tendency to compare um, your performance with theirs. And I would say, don't. You're running your own race. Um, there's people on the track with you, but you're running your race. Um, and that, that is in the area of grades, keep that in mind. That's in the area of class. You're gonna have a lot of, you know, really talented, articulate classmates who will pontificate sometimes to no end um, on different areas of the law. By the way, don't be that person. There's a fine line between um, contributing to an educational Socratic environment and just kind of soapboxing. But that aside, um, you know, uh, don't, think that just because your, your colleagues are making brilliant comments and that everybody's got to get it figured out way more than you. Um, kind of nobody does. You're all kind of like going through this experience together and trying to figure it out together. And, and it's an individual thing. So don't compare yourself to others. Only compare yourself to kind of how you performed last time and try to get better um, because it'll all even out in the end. In the end. And your world will enlarge, in, enlarge in, the, in the sense that you're going to be leaving Southwestern at some point. Um, and the, the competition stuff will matter at all, which is a good thing about Southwestern. I don't think that there's a ton of like cutthroat competition, but you can make it up in your own head to where you feel like that's the case. So my advice to you would be don't as, mu as much as you can. The other thing is um, in terms of, you know, uh, Professor Garkani was talking about all the activities that everyone was in talking about that they were involved in and are involved in in law school. My advice would be follow your interests you know, and to say in a way that might sound more trite, follow your heart. I think that, you know, you're going to do good at things that you're very interested in and that inspire you. Um, so my approach was not to reach for the shiniest of objects that appeared to be the most prestigious on their face. My, my approach was to reach for those things that I was most interested and passionate about. And I thought that 
at the, in the end, it was less work because I was very interested in those things. So as you think about and you hear about the things that people are, are involved in, um, and, you, and you know, at some point you'll be thinking about, well, what should I do? I would say go wherever your interests lie, and that may change now when you're about to be, you know, you're about to enter law school versus you take a few classes, you have a semester under your belt, um, and you may have, you may change your view on what you're interested in. But in any, in any event, I think go for what you're interested in. Yeah, try things too, because you never know. You may find some things that you didn't think you were interested in. But I think that's a good guiding principle um, to run your own race and follow your interests. And I think that you'll, uh, if you keep those two things in mind, sort of tuning out a lot of the other sort of distractions and noise that can exist in a very, you know, an, a very rigorous academic environment, um, I think that uh, I think that you'll be best suited to kind of have a successful career. So right before I um, started law school, I I don't know if this program is still around, but I remember that I participated in I think it was the legal writing boot camp uh, taught by Professor Detalia, and uh, it I. I think that that was a great experience for me because it exposed some of the weaknesses that I had in my writing, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, and I think a lot of you are going to feel that way. I feel like that was a general consensus for a lot of people just because legal writing is such a unique concept. And uh, prior to coming to law school, I thought I was great. Uh, and then I realized that this was going to be something that was going to require um, perhaps a little bit more effort than anything I had to uh, work hard at before. And so uh, I participated in this class and um, I, was a, I, I became aware of maybe some of the things that I had to work on. And the summer before uh, I, I started law school, I actually read a lot of books on just English grammar. And I tried to develop a skill set that would make me feel um, a little bit confident um, uh, when I started school. And slowly but surely I heard so many different you know, so many people will have different words of wisdom for you, but I think one of the things that resonated uh, with me the most is that having strong writing skills would be your sword and shield. And uh, for me, that became very important. And any time that I looked for an internship or an externship experience, I made sure to to expose that. I think it you may feel you might feel a little bit vulnerable, but I think it's okay. I think it's courageous to say. I don't think uh, I have enough writing experience or I would like to be better at you know, doing legal writing and research. Can I please have some of these uh, assignments? And so it's about being proactive um, to ask for things. And I was never turned away by any of my supervising attorneys. I think everyone was very um, excited to coach me uh, through, through my learning experience and to challenge me. So I would say that you know, don't be afraid if you feel like there's something you need to improve on, I would say expose it, find the help, and I can assure you that there's going to be someone that's going to help you through that. Um, another thing is that I do encourage students to connect with their professors. For me, that was my saving grace. And I remember the first time I went to office hours, it was actually Professor Cameron's office hours. And we were walking towards his office and he said, well, if you have any questions, you know, you can start asking me now. And uh, I didn't really have a question. I just felt lost and I didn't know how to pose that. And I, and I just looked up at him and I said, you know, I'm really scared of failing law school. I really can't afford to fail. And uh, that was the moment that created this mentorship uh, relationship with him. And he gave me so many uh, practice exams that I completed diligently week after week after week after week. Um, and today he continues to be my mentor and an advocate for me as well. Um, so I would say, don't be afraid to approach your professors. That for me um, really changed my experience in law school and even as a professional now. Uh, I have my job at Churla um, because I heard about it through a professor at Southwestern who uh, recommended me for the position. And so it's those relationships that you carry through um, that help you succeed in law school and in your career. Um, another thing that I just want to say that I also think is very important, um, and it's a, what Michael said resonated with me, that your world uh, you know, becomes a lot bigger because you're exposed uh, to something so new, but at the same time, it does shrink. 
And I think for me, the first year or so, it shrunk too much. And uh, I was constantly feeling anxious. And uh, I don't think that that's the way anyone should feel. I mean, being in law school is a, priv it's a privilege. It's, it should be exciting. Um, you should be happy. You, it should be enjoyable. And of course, it's going to come with moments where you feel pressured or you feel a little bit of stress. But if that's the way you're feeling the majority of the time, uh, my recommendation to you is to uh, talk to someone and get help because the marathon starts when you start as a student, not when you start as a lawyer. And I think it's very important to start weaving in um, this work-life balance, even as a student. And I came in just way too hungry. And I thought it was fine to cut everything off and just focus on the books. And, and that I recognize now, you know, in hindsight, that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, because that can easily happen to you again when you become an attorney. Uh, you become so involved and so invested in your cases that you lose your sense of self. And so I would, my, you know, my advice is not to lose yourself in this because it can be a very rewarding career. Um, and it starts with the choices that you make in your personal life as well. So thank you, all of you, for um, all the great information, the candid kind of insight into what you went through and what helped you. Um, and I just wanted to kind of pick up on one point in terms of the importance of connections. Um, you've probably noticed if you joined us, you know, before our program started, that a number of faculty were just in the room just to meet you. Um, and chat with you and answer your questions. Um, and as we're moving towards wrapping up our program today, uh, another group of faculty are joining us. I see Professor John Heilman, I see Dean Natalie Rodriguez, um, we have others from this morning, um, and all of us are here to connect with you. So in addition to presenting you, you know, this program and this information, but we wanna be a face, a name that you now know now you feel like you can just shoot an email to me and ask me a question about externships or legal writing or anything about Southwestern. And the thing that I always share with my students is, you know, today you're my student and we need to have that teacher-student relationship, but I'm also looking at you as a future colleague. So I remember Karen as a student. I remember Michael as a student. And when I'm establishing these relationships and hopefully me, my colleagues, helping, helping them get through law school and graduate and become really accomplished attorneys, I'm also thinking I'm gonna call on them and say, you know, I have a student who's really interested in your area of practice. Will you please take him on as an extern? Will you please come back and be an adjunct professor for us? Would you please come back and coach a negotiations team or a trial advocacy honors team, et cetera. So we want to establish these relationships with you. Um, we have about 15 minutes before we wrap up, but we're gonna stay and answer uh, any questions that you have for however long you wanna stick around. So now I do wanna open up the floor for questions and I'll kind of keep track of the raised hands. Um, Kelly. Kelly Mayer. Hi, everybody. Um, I am particularly interested in the entertainment landscape of the legal environment, but I'm sure this question kind of pertains to every area. I have, in my short career, um, had trouble with getting my foot in the door in certain places, and I'm wondering how involved your alums are in any kind of, like, connecting people and getting your foot in the door and how like Southwestern can help you get your foot in the door. Sure, so um, I'm going to ask Professor Rabid to respond, but also Vanessa, you're in your fourth year. You're very much interested in entertainment law. You come from that background, but you've also had the opportunity to do externships, connect with alums. Um, so do you wanna respond briefly and then we'll hear from Professor Rabid as well? Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a great question. And um, Southwestern, this is the reason I chose Southwestern, um, because of their entertainment um, course offerings, the department, and just how they are light years ahead of 
any institution really in how they are able to navigate that and what they can offer. And so um, there is the Biederman Institute. You walk in and they will hug you. They, <laughs> they love you. They want you there. There's an amazing um, London program, a London abroad program, which unfortunately couldn't happen this year. And so I wasn't able to participate, but um, some of my classmates have gone and it's an incredible opportunity to learn so many different facets of entertainment law and just broaden your horizons um, overseas. And so you come back with knowledge that is um, leaps and bounds above what other students may have been able to get during their tenure, um, where, I mean, not their tenure, their matriculation at what school they are at. Um, but for me personally, um, there's this, uh, it's almost like a woven connection that Southwestern has. My most recent um, externship was at Viacom CBS. And so we have an amazing externship office. You go to them, tell them exactly what your situation is, tell them your heart's desires, and they will do whatever they can to make sure it's implemented. You know, I told them I, I didn't know how I could do an externship and work at the same time. They said, don't worry, we got you. I want to do entertainment. I want to be at a, a, you know, a major company. Hey, we can help you out. You still have to come to the table with dedication, with you know hard work and, and show yourself worthy, but they'll put you in the right places. And then I get to Viacom and my, my supervisor there graduated from Southwestern, is an adjunct professor at Southwestern. There's all these connections. I, I needed a mentor. They put me in touch with, um, her name's Jennifer. She graduated from Southwestern, works at BT has worked in the entertainment field for years after graduation. And so everywhere you turn, there's an opportunity to meet someone, to connect with someone, to work under someone who has either been a Southwestern alum, knows someone at Southwestern, is champion of the program, and just really wants to see you flourish. And so entertainment is probably one of the hardest fields to get your foot in, but there's no one better <laughs> that can do it other than Southwestern because they just really have um, the proven track record and the robust alumni connection to really get you where you want to go. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out. So I hope someone else can to speak to it because I'm just so excited, but you're in the right place. I think everything you said was fantastic and accurate. And I see that Professor John Heilman also shared about our entertainment law clinic, which I shared earlier. And Kelly, you wrote an email to me that I've answered. You'll see, you'll see that in your inbox. Um, as a student, I tell you, Truly, I didn't spend five minutes looking for a job. I went to a Southwestern networking event and I was offered a job by an alum, but like as I was walking out the door. Uh, then my next job, I was in the first job, got a call from someone at Southwestern who lobbied for me to get hired at another firm. Um, and now I I'd spend time as, a, as an actual practicing entertainment attorney while being the director of the Biederman Law Institute and a professor there. Um, the externships that we've been talking about, I've not one time spoken to a supervisor at an externship for entertainment law students who didn't say that our students were the best prepared and did amazing work and were then interested in seeing about placing them for jobs when they pass the bar or even prior to that as clerks. Um, we have a tremendous network. Yesterday, just yesterday, I was on the phone with someone who's in-house at Apple, previously at CBS who's interested in helping us uh, with a course as an adjunct professor and who said he was particularly excited because he loved being able to then get to know students to help figure out helping them get work, you know, at, at where he works at Apple. The same thing is true for folks at Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. So our, and you know, because we've been a law school for, you know, a very long time since the early 1900s and the program has been around the Biederman Institute since the early 2000s, um, it's just a vast, vast network of people mostly practicing in this state, uh, but, but not only in this state. In fact, one of my former students just got a job at the NFL. Um, so anyway, yes, uh, tremendous support, tremendous access. And uh, if you avail yourself of the program, you will be very, very prepared more than most in this country. And if I could just chime in too, because this is a big, one of the big reasons and one of the greatest things about Southwestern I found, like Vanessa said, and so the, for those of you who maybe aren't interested in entertainment, but maybe have the same kind of question sort of generally, there's a huge almost army-like uh, amount of Southwestern alum who love this school, who want to take students under their wing, talk to them, get them jobs. Um, Jennifer, I'm sure Vanessa's referring to my classmate, Jennifer Duval, um, who she's one of my closest law school friends. We've been texting all day because you know today is an interesting day. Um, and you know we're still friends to this day. She's always taking people under her wing and trying to help them get jobs. 
Um, my first year of law school, I tried out for the trial advocacy honors program, which is the mock trial team. At the very end of the uh, competition, the director came up to me and said, hey, what are you doing this summer? I said, I, I applied for the public defender's office. They haven't heard back from me. He said, you're going to work for me at the DA's office. Um, and so he hired me there. Um, and I got a, a number of externships just from Southwestern alum or Southwestern alum that were actually practicing attorneys as well as doing their job at Southwestern. I mean, I'm an adjunct professor now at Southwestern. I've done, you know, I've coached mock trial there as well. Um, you know, we're here on a Saturday morning. I assure you, well, at least I'm not being paid. <laughs> I'm not a paid spokesperson. This is truly just like a labor of love in the sense that we love the school. We're interested and in, and in, in dialed into the outcome of the students being successful. We are not people who are have a lot of idle time on our hands, right? We're attorneys. My, my friends who are attorneys work 12 hour days, Jennifer being one of them. I'm here at work on a Saturday morning, um, but here I am. And it's because the um, environment that you experience when you're a student at Southwestern then translates to how you feel about the school and the, and the administrators and the professors who later become colleagues, if you will. Um, to me, it's kind of un, unparalleled or unmatched Again, when I speak to people who are also practicing attorneys and they talk about their law school experience, whenever I talk to friends that I was classmates with and I say, I'm going to do this thing with Southwestern, this panel, whatever, they're like, oh, how can I do that? Like, I want to be involved, you know, and, and they're busy folks. So um, in terms of the network, in terms of the enthusiasm, in terms of the interest and in mentorship, uh, the investment in your career, I mean, Southwestern hands down, I think that to me was the biggest draw and it's the biggest um, sort of uh, you know resource that you have because you're going to you're starting your career off and you'll be starting off with really no career experience so it becomes critical to the extent that there are people who are practicing law who can vouch for you can write you a letter make a phone call for you that includes your your colleagues and classmates i got my first job from a classmate who got a job and then her firm had an opening and she said hey i know this guy named michael I knew him from school, um, give him an interview, you know, and I had only kind of interacted with her in passing, but, you know, she just had that, that sense of community. Um, and so, yeah, that's hugely important for a young law student, a, lo a young lawyer. And here, I think you're going to find that to be one of the biggest assets to being here. Thanks, Kelly, for the great question and all the helpful responses. Um, I just want to quickly say that we have a few uh, more members of our faculty who've joined us, Vice Dean Dove Weissman, and we have Dean Julie Waterstone, who oversees our clinics, experiential courses. I see Professor Kristen Lofgren, who is in our legal writing program. Um, Jessica Rios, you have a question. I have a couple questions. My first question revolves around biases. So how do you guys deal with your own biases when it comes to different cases? And how did you learn to manage your biases in certain aspects in the work field? So Karen, Michael, would you like to take that question? Sure, I'll jump in. I mean, look, I'm a prosecutor. So this is this is ground zero, right? And so vetting in terms of dealing with your own biases, um, vetting your own background, your own experience, your own perspective constantly, and to my mind, I think it's ext extremely important for, for an attorney in general to make sure as they interact with clients or opposing counsel or judges or witnesses or you know parties and so on, that they are constantly um, holding themselves accountable as to the extent to which their own life's perspectives and unconscious biases are impacting the way or the way that they're performing or not performing at their job. So I think it, it's not unique. I mean, you're, as a lawyer, your, um, your mandate, your um, responsibility, your obligation to the community is an elevated one than just, you know, if you're maybe in another job. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's even more important, but it's not, um, vastly different than kind of going through life and um, trying to constantly be aware and avail yourself of your own biases. As a lawyer, you know, what you're going to find, though, is that you have what's called a continuing education um, sort of requirement. 
and they're called MCLEs. Don't worry about that now. But just know that once you pass the bar, the bar is going to require you to to engage in certain you know kind of educational um, you know endeavors. And one of the things that they focus on is ethics and this idea of biases and so on. So that's one way that you can kind of stay cued in and tuned into it. Um, but you know, quite frankly, my experience at Southwestern again has helped me with that in the sense that I'm still connected with the law school community. I'm still seeing bright-eyed and bushy-tailed law students who, um, you know, remind me that, uh, you know, this job isn't just about, it's not just a job, you know, it's kind of a calling, right? So I think keeping that in mind, continuing to check yourself, continuing to hold yourself accountable, you know, availing yourself of what's going on in the world. I think that's huge. Uh, it speaks to what Corinne was saying and not being so um, focused on the work that you lose the big picture, you know, so just being um, being involved and understand what's going on in the world and checking yourself constantly. I think that's the best you can do as a lawyer, as a person really, but as a lawyer in particular, because, you know, as a lawyer, no matter what area of law, you have a huge impact on the community. Um, and so you have to hold yourself to much, much higher standards. Thank you. Well, nice. Um, before we hear from Karen and take additional questions, I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. We're at the end of the hour. And so we hope that you all continue to stay and ask questions and we want to engage with you. But if somebody needs to leave, understandable. And we want to thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. Um, so Jessica, before going back to your second question, Karan, did you want to answer the biases question? Um, I do think that it is important, like uh, Michael said, it's, it's something that you constantly have to work on to check your preconceived notions of the world. Um, and I think particularly for me as an immigration practitioner, um, one of the things that I felt even going into these, um, you know, immigration and custom enforcement uh, facilities uh, is that, you know, the enemy was lurking everywhere. And quite frankly, I had to check that because sometimes you have allies in there. And you never really know um, if you go in there with that mindset, if that's going to stop you from prevent from creating these connections that are going to be helpful to your client. And so I think it's important and only experience is going to give you that neutral um, ground point for, for you when you approach every single case. And I think it's, you know, something that's going to be a work in progress, but certainly something that, um, you know, your, these, these, these perceptions that you that you have are going to be tested and, and, and eventually, um, you know, I, I think you work towards just being better um, with, with these preconceptions uh, that we all develop over time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're having some questions and answers in the chat um, until others want to um, participate and pose their question in the meeting. I wanted to ask Dean Rodriguez if you could talk briefly about our Bison Bootcamp program. Earlier we were talking about transitioning to law school, getting acclimated to law school. So if you could just talk a little bit about this free of charge program that we have for our incoming students. Happy to. Hi everyone, so nice to see you. Uh, I am Dean Natalie Rodriguez and I am the Assistant Dean for Academic Success but I'm also an alum at Southwestern. So as I was hearing some of our alums speaking to the tremendous support that they received at Southwestern, for me, it's such a great honor to have experienced that support from the very beginning before I made a decision to go to Southwestern. That was, I would say the number one factor for why I ultimately chose Southwestern. I felt like this was gonna be the place that was gonna support me in my unique um, story as Vanessa was, uh, you know, talking about how that's so important that you know who you are and where you may need help. And so I also went to law school. Um, Mary already had my two babies and my, my youngest was actually a baby. Um, I think she was just under one when I started law school. Um, and I felt like Southwestern was going to meet me where I was, where, where I needed the most support. And so my honor today is that I get to be that be a part of that support that we give our students. It's something that I don't take lightly. Uh, so one of those programs uh, that we offer students the summer before they start law school is Bison Bootcamp. It's a program that's free. Uh, it's open to all admitted Southwestern students. 
And um, the focus of that program is to just give you enough information about what law school is like, what kinds of uh, academic activities you're, you're gonna need to engage in in order to do well in your classes. Uh, by this, I mean, like, what is a case? You're gonna hear a lot about these cases that you're reading. Um, cases are documents that lawyers actually work with, but as a law student, you're using these cases in a different way. And so having a good grounding for what is a case? How do you approach reading cases? How do you prepare for um, law school lectures? That's also very different from undergrad. Um, in undergrad, your teachers or professors uh, give you a lot of summary information. That's how you learn. In law school, it's you learn through a dialogue where the professors are asking you questions and you need to think through what did the cases say and how does that uh, change the way I think about a new set of facts. Uh, so we go through a lot of those introductory law school concepts. Um, and the goal of the program is to give you enough of a taste for law school so that you can take those weeks or months uh, before you start law school to begin to arrange your life in a way that will be conducive to your ability to prepare and focus on courses. Um, I heard uh, Vanessa and Alex talk a lot about scheduling. Uh, we talk about that very candidly, um, not in a way to uh, scare students or uh, make you nervous about going to law school, but in a way to really empower you to understand what law school will require of you um, so that you can have conversations with your family or have conversations with employers. Um, and then let us help you build a schedule that will give you the space you need to do well in classes. So that's Bison Bootcamp. Uh, we offer a number of sessions over the summer so that you can find a, a date that works well with your schedule. We also offer day and evening sections of the program because we wanna be mindful of our, our evening students or even students who will ultimately be in the day program but may still be working over the summer. Um, so we have a program that should fit your, um, your, your schedule and, and whatever responsibilities you have over the summer. If you have any questions about Bison Bootcamp, please feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, our dates are to be determined for this summer, but we are working on that and hope to be able to publish those soon. And I will put my email in the chat box. Thanks so much, Dean Rodriguez. I was just gonna ask if you could add your email. Um, to my other colleagues um, who are here with us, um, Professor Wood, uh, Professor Heilman, Dean Waterstone, Dean, um, Weissman, Professor Cameron, um, Professor Lofgren, um, Bateman, jump in with anything that you'd like to add, Dean Rolnick, um, anything that you think would be helpful for our prospective students to know what you've experienced with your students, incoming students, what's going to be helpful to them. So Dean Waterstone, you had put something in the chat with respect to the clinics. Um, and we had questions about getting that hands-on experience. Can you just briefly talk about that? Sure. Um, and I will echo what Vanessa said about the Biederman Institute that I like to think that when folks walk into the clinic, they get a big hug there as well. Um, we do try to embrace every single person that comes through the door in any capacity that we can um, and offer a range of opportunities. So the hands-on clinical um, opportunities that we have include family law that we partner with Harriet View High Law Center. Um, we also offer a children's rights clinic that where students can get hands-on experience in special education type cases, an immigration law clinic, um, there's a street law clinic where students have the opportunity to work with at-risk youth and teach them what we call legal life skills. You've heard about the entertainment and the arts legal clinic. Um, there's also a clinic with CSUN where our students go, um, well, used to go onto CSUN's campus. Now we do it virtually, but offer anyone on their, any student on their campus, um, free legal advice. And this is a way that we take these opportunities to really hone your legal skills. You have actual cases, actual clients, and you're working on them from intake all the way through to completion. So that's one way that we um, try to develop you as lawyers. In addition, you are, I'm sure you heard about our fantastic externship program, which is another way to get 
um, hands-on legal experience. And then we have simulation courses and a whole host of them that really cover anything that you could possibly imagine. Um, so I think that whatever you want to do, we will do our best to ensure that you are ready to um, use the phrase, hit the ground running. And I think we do that incredibly well and happy to see all of you and to welcome you to our Southwestern community. Thank you. Um, so Dean Gear, there's a question in the chat about speaking about using the GI Bill um, and Yellow Ribbon Program as a military beneficiary. Is that something that you could address? Sure, um, we are a yellow ribbon school um, and we do have um, veterans who are able to use their GI Bill benefits. Um, what I'm going to put the email address for the financial aid office in the chat. Um, essentially what they do is they keep track of the students that receive those types of funding um, and they're, they're really your main point, uh, point of contact on our campus for that, but I'll, I'll put that in the chat for you. Other questions that we can answer for you and no question is too small. Um, if it's on your mind, we want to hear from you. Probably others are thinking about the same question. So, uh, Mark uh, asked a question about um, the benefits of going to school in California. And uh, Cheryl and I think Emily already addressed the answer. I, I would answer it a little bit more broadly. I think that all other things being equal, you're better off going to law school. Um, in the city or the region where you intend to practice. California is an awfully big place, so there's a lot of different spots, all of which will prepare you for the California bar if you go to law school here. But um, while we have graduates that are all over the country, uh, I've got graduates working on Wall Street and working in Washington, working in Hawaii. Um, I think uh, on balance, if wherever you plan to wind up practicing, if you know, um, it's best to go to law school in that place. COVID is going to be over one day. People are going to be back in physical spaces. And the places where you're going to build your contacts and build your networks with alumni, with professors in the classroom, with other classmates, um, the places where you're going to do externships are more likely to, to be in the city where you're going to school. And um, that turns into springboard for finding jobs and making connections when, when you get out. It isn't that you can't do it in other ways. We do that all the time. But I think that that's the major benefit to going to law school um, in the place where you intend to wind up. And I think Los Angeles, great place to do that. And we think of ourselves as LA's law school because um, we've been producing LA grads that go on to be in all the positions of importance in big firms and little firms and the government on the judiciary, we've got huge numbers of people in all those places, and this is a good spot for it. Thanks for that. So, Professor Heil. Anahid, I just want to point out that uh, a lot of us came to LA with not with the intention of staying, but we fell in love with it. So, um, I would encourage those of you who are not from Los Angeles. If your instinct is to come, I hope you will, um, and I hope you find it exciting. Professor Heilman, I'm gonna call on you. So since you've joined Southwestern every year, I think you've received our Excellence in Teaching Award. Students love, love, love your teaching and find it so effective. Can you talk a little bit about what's your approach that's so resonates with students year after year in different kinds of courses? Well, I, I would say that uh, it's not just me. I think everyone at Southwestern really has a commitment to teaching. Um, it's our priority, making sure that our students um, are able to learn the doctrinal material that they need to pass the bar exam but also making sure that we're challenging students and that we are getting them to think in a way that um, is expected in the legal profession, uh, paying attention to details, uh, understanding the facts, being advocates for their positions. So 
I think I've been successful um, and the students have been so generous with their support. I think I've been successful because I've had a lot of experience teaching and I, I've struggled with certain concepts over the years and I've figured out how to um, make it understandable to others. So I think that's what has helped me in the, the teaching role. I appreciate that. And what Professor Holloman was just sharing in terms of, you know, we're all continuously learning and developing. That's a huge part of Southwestern faculty's focus. Um, we are continuously having forums, workshops, sharing with each other, going to conferences, um, keeping up with learning science in terms of what, what are effective ways of teaching? Because it's not about us. It's the impact that we have on our students and the students' learning. Um, so Professor Lofgren, I'm going to call on you now. You come from a practice background. You were in-house for a long time with a very big company. And so coming from that background and now teaching first-year students in legal writing, um, what are your views with respect to what you know what the market requires and what you're seeing among Southwestern students. Thank you for that uh, introduction and question. Nice to see all of you um, on, uh, on Zoom here today. So I, I came to Southwestern a few years ago after a long career in private practice, both in law firm settings and then most recently in-house for a major corporation. So I bring a very practical approach to my teaching um, as well as a passion for teaching that I've really had all my life. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to, to put that into practice here at Southwestern. So I teach legal writing to the first year students. And um, we have a very intense legal writing program that goes through the whole first year. We have a very um, small class sections and we give a lot of individualized attention. So I both work with students in the classroom as well as a lot of written feedback, uh, constructive feedback, as well as individual one-on-one -on -one appointments. So it's kind of like having um, the best of all worlds, the, the supervisor who has a lot of time to keep working with you throughout your project. And my biggest pride and joy is getting the students ready to go out and put that legal analysis, legal writing skill and research skill into practice when they get their first externship. I keep in touch with my former students who are now upper division uh, Southwestern students and have had some experiences in externships. And really the best thing that I could ever hear is that all of the Southwestern students are excellent, um, well-trained, have great practical skills and maturity and um, all of the good things that work well into the workplace as well as the academic setting. So, that is my approach to teaching the first year students to really develop these practical skills and go out and use them. And as you've heard from some of our other professors and uh, senior deans and staff that Southwestern has wonderful connections in the world of entertainment or other, other industries. Um, we've had, I think, uh, you know, some uh, Michael mentioned he got hired on the spot for the DA's office externship. Um, so we have both the connections and the opportunities as well as the courses that will let you get ready and um, be ready to practice those skills. So I look forward to answering any other questions you may have about legal writing or practice, you know, how to, how to transition your uh, first year and future legal writing experience into practice. Happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that was very helpful. And Professor Wood and Weistein um, Weissman, um, so you have both taught in the evening program. And often questions that we get from students who are interested in the evening program is, you know, how doable is it after a day's work to be in class at 6, 7, 8 p.m.? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What your experience has been with our evening classes? Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was going to let you go. Um, well, so, you know, hello, Vanessa, right? Uh, she was in my uh, evening section class a couple years ago. 
Um, so she may be able, you know, to, to speak to this too. Um, Professor Cameron, you know, as well as has taught in the evening program before. But, um, you know, and I have friends, you know, people that are, uh, I guess, you know, I went to college with or whatever, you know, I got a buddy that's doing it in New York. So I tell my students, you know, he's like the East Coast version of you. And um, I text with him, you know, ask him how it's going, try to get his perspective, right? So that I have um, a, a perspective maybe of some of what they're experiencing. Um, but I think the thing that's really uh, challenging for evening students, and again, right, I'm speaking from you know, my understanding of it and certainly not from their experiences, but just what I hear from people um, is the the time management and, and, and putting in the work. Time management. And I mean, one thing that I say, you know, all along is, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, even, you know, for one uh, L's, you know, traditional students. Um, but it's, you know, the work that you have to put in, uh, not only in terms of reading, you know, I mean, that's what my buddy says, says. Oh man, the amount of reading is just crazy. Um, but also, you know, trying to do practice exams, you know, and figure out how you're going to actually have to apply the material, how you're going to be tested on it. Um, and then, you know, dealing with those uh, challenges for anyone, but especially, you know, job, family, you know, and as um, Dean Garakarian was talking about, you know, when uh, kind of at the end of a long week or the end of a long day and you know it's Wednesday it's Thursday evening you know I'm, I'm teaching this year Wednesday evenings two hours you know it's nine o'clock and I'm trying to be as entertaining or you know engaging or whatever as I can um but yeah back to the the student side it's I think um a lot of the challenge is finding the time or making the time to put in the work. I mean, what we, you know, I, I, I talk bar exam and bar passage from day zero. And I say, you know, the, the bar exam's not hard, you know, studying for it's what's hard. Okay, and, and when, right, uh, you're gonna be able to find and make the time to put in the work that you know you have to do to be successful. And you know, the, uh, Professor, you know, Dean Rodriguez, her, her program, they, uh, Professor Heilman's involved with this, really good support for bar studying preparation. They have data out there, you know, people that do the work, you know, the bar passage rate, um, you know, 75%, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, across the board, you know, and for the, you know, breakdown of the tiers uh, or, or you know, quartiles, the highest ones, you know, it's in the 90% uh, for a passage rate, but it's the people who do the work, right, are the ones, you know, that pass at those rates. And so, you know, that's the, that's the challenge, you know, the, the, the whole way across. So, um, yeah, you know, probably went on too Thanks. long there, but I apologize. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Dean Weissman, from your perspective. Yeah, I think I think Professor Wood pretty much captured it. I think, you know, we have many, many successful students go through our evening program who go on to be, you know, terrific attorneys and um, our wonderful law students. So it's certainly a program where we see a great deal of success. I do think that the challenge that Professor Wood identifies, the one of time management, is the one I hear again and again. Um, from students. It's not that the classes are harder or that there's more reading that there would be um, if you were in a full-time program. It's that, you know, most evening students work full-time. Um, many of them have families or other caregiving responsibilities. Um, so, you know, unlike a full-time student, I think many of our evening students are in a position where they just don't have the time to do very much during the week other than go to class. And so the weekends, I think, for many evening students tend to be the time where they do their reading, do their briefing, um, you know, do the outlining and all the other stuff that you need to do um, in law school. You know, one of the misconceptions about law school is that most of the work is in the reading, and there is a lot of reading. Um, but that's not, uh, I don't think that's really true. I, I think where, if you talk to successful students, what you're gonna hear is that where you really learn the material 
is after you've done the reading, after you've gone to class, when you're sitting alone and you're really just putting everything together, we call that synthesizing. You know, there's really three things that you have to do success, to be successful as a law student. You've, you have to intake a lot of information very well. You have to have focus and a really long attention span. You're taking in a lot of information in your reading. You're taking a lot of information um, in, in class. But I think probably the most important single activity is not the intake, but the processing. And this is where your real learning happens. It's outside of class, it's after class, when you're sitting there with all your materials, your notes, your briefs, um, you know, your horn book, um, and you put everything together. And usually the document that, you know, we suggest that you use to put everything together is an outline. Um, but it's really one, I mean, you can get, you can buy outlines, you can borrow outlines from people, that's not gonna help you. What really helps you is writing the outline on your own um, that's the, uh, that's the real, that's where the real learning happens when you are processing the information, synthesizing it, putting it all together. Um, so that's a little bit of a digression from the question about the evening program, but it's just a way of seeing that, you know, most of the real learning for law students happens outside of class. And I would say even more than before class, when you're doing your reading and your briefing, it's what you do after class, when you've covered the concept with your professor and your classmates, now you have all the information and you begin to put it all together for yourself. And then crucially, crucially, you practice the skill that you're really gonna have to demonstrate on your exams, which is taking the law and the policy um, that you've learned, the rules, the standards, taking everything for a given course and applying it to a new fact pattern that you haven't seen before. Um, unless you're a one in a million legal genius, which I'm certainly not, um, most of us have to practice that in order to get good at it. Uh, and I mean, repeatedly practice it over and over again, seeing hundreds of fact patterns um, and beginning to see themes and patterns uh, between different fact patterns. You know, I like to remind students that the, the degree that you're getting, JD is a Juris Doctor. And in a way you are becoming a doctor where, but instead of seeing a, a patient, you're seeing a fact pattern. And just like, you know, a doctor trains by seeing thousands of patients over and over and they can begin to develop a sort of holistic wisdom about assessing disease or pathology, you'll do the same thing as a jurist doctor, but instead of seeing patients, you'll see sets of facts. And the more facts you see and the more you apply the law to them, the more you'll develop that holistic organic wisdom um, that you know most of us need to practice a lot for many years to be able to do that. So that's all a way of saying that, you know, this is, you gotta work hard in law school. It's, you gotta work harder than you did in college uh, and you gotta work differently than you did in college. There's a lot of practice on your own. Um, it's not just about doing some reading, going to a lecture, taking notes and then moving on. And so for evening students, I think that's the real challenge is, is not so much making it to class, but finding the time to do all the information processing and practicing that you have to do outside of class to be successful. And uh, anyone interested in our evening program, periodically we do specific open houses, admission sessions about the evening program, and there's one coming up in November. So anyone interested, you'll get an invitation to that. Uh, Dean Prager? I just wanted to add that for any part-time student who is working, whether they're part-time day or part-time evening, I think it's really important to think about are you going to take some of your vacation time before exams or during exams when you need you know, more of this time focusing on it? It may not be possible in your kind of work. Uh, the other thing I've say, I'd say, I've talked to a lot of evening students who try to do all their reading on the weekend and then just reviewing it before class, but that doesn't work for everyone. And I see Vanessa shaking her head on that one. So I think people who are part-time students and working full-time, you know, have to use every moment that they can create otherwise um, to make it all work because the part-time after all only extends the program by one year. Uh, one year and using two summers is our assumption. So um, it's not as much relief as perhaps it should be. Vanessa, I feel like calling on you. 
No, I, I, I agree with everything that everyone has said. It is really about um, finding that time. I think what um, I didn't expect going in is um, that people will tell you, you know, you need to cut things out and kind of trim the fat where you can. Well, in my experience, there were just not that many things I could say no to. And so when I um, delay all week, you know, things that I need to get done, real life still happens. And so we still need groceries, um, laundry still needs to be done. And all week, you know, I'm trying to go to class, but it's hard to look at my kids on the weekends and say, no, um, I've avoided you all week. And I, now I need to avoid you on the weekends too, because I need to read and synthesize and understand and do a practice exam. And, you know, my kids are seven and four, so they don't understand that. And so when we talk about finding the time and, and looking at your schedule, um, I also didn't realize like that may not be weekends either. It may be after class, you know, sometimes I, I'm, a, I'm a night owl. So sometimes my studying looks like midnight um, because my kids are asleep and my husband's asleep and it's quiet and I can zone in. And so you really just have to find what works for you and just um, the things that you're not comfortable saying no to don't. I don't say no to my kids. I will go to events and school activities and soccer and dance and volleyball and I will do everything. And then, um, you know, and then I, I find time elsewhere to make up for the studying that I may have missed. And, you know, maybe I don't have a 4.0, but um, I had to be okay with that because I still, I do the best that I can. And um, you just have to figure out what that looks like for you, but it may not be the weekends either. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. Professor Cameron? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, what, Vanessa has just confirmed for you is that going to school at night is taking on a, a second full-time job um, if you're working during the day. And if you're raising a family too, it's a third full-time job. Um, so let me just talk about what the benefit is from what I've seen. I love teaching night students because you got to really want it to do that. And that's who I want in my class. Um, I want people who know how to sort through things and get to the important stuff um, because they don't have the time um, to go down too many rabbit holes and, and uh, you know, waste their time. Um, and I feel that it's my job in teaching at night to reward people for their, um, their persistence. And so I don't expect, I don't, I don't think that night students are necessarily any smarter than anybody else, but they're a little bit smarter about how to use their time. And um, that's a tremendous advantage. And also night students, because of their experience, whether it's raising a family or working, um, bring a perspective that a lot of folks that are right out of college don't. And I often rely on night students when I find out what they do, whether they're working in an accounting firm or they're working as a paralegal or banking, or they're a cop or a teacher or whatever it is, um, get them to share those experiences when I have cases that raise what they do in those areas. So I love having night students. And if that's, if that's you, uh, you know, welcome to our class because you're going to make my life better. Can I just add the evening professors are amazing because they they care about your life. They care about what happens outside of your life and they keep you awake at nine o'clock. Like Professor Wood brought Tinker Toys so that I can understand supplemental jurisdiction. I mean, uh, yeah, just, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they they're, they they engage you in a different way. They care. And so they're there to um, to understand your situation as well. So um, Dean Gear, uh, while we wait to see if there are any last questions, anything from the admissions office, any announcements, um, final words from your office? Um, sure. Well, I'd just like to say thank you again to everybody who spent so much of their Saturday with us. Um, we really appreciate you giving us a chance to show you exactly why Southwestern is so special. And from the comments, I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, most seem to have really come away with a sense of our tremendous community. So thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, we've put a few links in the chat periodically, um, but please make sure you are keeping up with our upcoming event calendar. It's on our website. It's www.swlaw slash admissions with an S Cal. Um, I'll put it in the chat again. We have um, a speaker series that we've been doing this fall. So we have two coming up um, still for this month on the 16th. We're going to feature a current scale student. On the 30th, we're going to have a scale alum. 
sandwiched in between there on the 23rd, I'm going to do another workshop for inside the CAS report. So if you are applying for this year, or even if you have already applied, you might still benefit from learning a little bit more about that. That CAS report is the LSAT report essentially that we get. So the scores, the writing sample, the transcripts, how the GPA is calculated by LSAC, um, and then of course the letters of recommendation. So we'll kind of break all of that down and I hope you join us for that. We are going to make this recording available for you um, in a few days. So it'll be available on the Southwestern Gateway website that Nancy has posted a couple of times in the chat as well. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at that site, I, I do highly encourage you. You're gonna get some, um, some clips that we had filmed for orientation, which you know we intentionally put for today's event. Uh, because it really does show again that spirit of the community that we have. It's a it's a really tremendous um, group of students that we have that make up our entire student body, and and you've had a chance to see and hear from some of them today. So um, I just want to echo echo my thanks to the panelists and our ambassadors. Um, my office is available anytime if you need us um, or just want to chat and check in about your application. You are welcome to. Um, you can schedule a meeting with any of us. Uh, current student, which includes our ambassadors, they have ambassador office hours um, as well. And then we can also set up appointments for you to meet with some of our faculty. So please take us up on those opportunities to engage on a more and one on one level, but do keep coming back for our events too, because as hopefully you have come away with today, they're pretty tremendous. Thank you, thank you. Um, and yes, the evening event that I mentioned that's coming up, that's going to be November 16th. Um, and thank you for all the panelists and guests and faculty who shared your emails. Um, any final questions that we can answer for you before we wrap up? The sun is coming out, so maybe we have a short window to get out and enjoy a little bit of vitamin D and the fresh air. Um, but we want to make sure that we answer all your questions first. Very good. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful day.